So it's not just that Ahab is kind of secretly has this little mission that he wants to go mm-hmm. and seek out Moby Dick and that everybody else is kind of in it for the whaling. Because people don't even see Ahab for a little bit once they get on the boat to go and do the whaling voyage. Mm-hmm. And then finally Ahab makes himself known as his grand entrance. And he's like, hey guys, actually, I, I don't care about the money. This is, I'm in it for revenge. And you guys all are too, actually. Because if you're out here, the reason you, the reason you would even go to sea is because you're fed up with what's on land. You're fed up with the structure of things. Mm-hmm. And so you want to get over it. So the way we're going to do this, we're going to get back at society. We're going to get back at everything that's wrong with the world because it's all Moby Dick's fault. Yeah. And the sailors are like, yeah, <laughs> probably is. <laughs> Well, he even manipulates them in a way saying, you know, this is what God wants you to do, or this is what God expects us to do. Right. And yeah, people like Starbuck, who hear that, like a person like Starbuck would be like, okay, yeah, I have to do that. Charles, you don't have a copy of the book, but you have it all no. memorized, right? Yeah. He knows everything. <laughs> like, it's all in his head. He's, he's good at this kind of stuff. Perfect. Uh, Usually I don't like how people, like, introduce themselves, but I feel like it kind of makes sense just because, you know, randomly, sure. why, why am I having these two yeah. two students over yeah. here? What, what are we doing? <laughs> uh, so do you want to, like, can... Well, I, I guess the question I wanted to ask you guys both to kind of start with was, like, do you... Why are you reading classics why do you want to read moby dick or i mean is it specifically classics you, you're you're doing like american lit english lit what's the, yeah what's the, yeah it's what's the first, um, yeah. Uh, english literature tradition also the, evan has this little window thing here if you if you want to like look anything up you can always oh cool you can pin that out but uh yeah i don't know do you guys want to kind of explain yourselves a little bit like why are you why why do we get to take this course together i don't know <laughs> because <laughs> professor parody is an easy marker is it? <laughs> Also, also English, they have like five offerings at Brantford every year, and we have to take five classes every year. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I was talking to Kenny, he was saying it's like, it was kind of the design of the program is to like keep it super small so all the students get to know each other too, mm-hmm, which sure. is kind of, kind of a cool, I don't know, it, you get a little bit of something there that you don't always get in at least... I don't know. I, I, I didn't don't have multiple university experiences personally to uh, to compare. Sit in on a but. crim class. It's like three hundred people, and uh, every year like a hundred of them flunk out. Nobody has ever graduated from criminology in Brantford Jeez. campus. <laughs> Yikes! Three hundred people. Yeah, like that's you can't have a conversation or get to know that many people. <laughs> no. Yeah. So yeah, Moby Dick. It was. Um, it was um, like happening the same time as another course, climate fiction, which I was also considering Ooh, taking. Um, and I really wanted to take it. But um, um, Dr. Parody, like he advertised Moby Dick very well and kept talking about it. And I, I've heard from other students yeah. that was their favorite course. Exactly. Um, so I guess that's what really drew that to me. And I've, 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 I didn't know anything about Moby Dick coming in. I knew nothing yeah. about it. I've, I mean, I, I haven't had time to read it in the past. So I think that's one of the things that drew drew me to taking that course, too, was like, I want to know more about this book. I hear yeah. everyone talk about it. And especially, yeah Ken, yeah, Ken sells it pretty well, too. He does I, sell it well. Because, I mean, I'm, obviously, I'm not even a student. Yeah. But I wanted to take this class. Part, yeah, I mean, so I just cool. wanted to hang out with Ken, but he, like, he his, sold this I class. I love his classes. Yeah. I love his classes. He was his like, okay, this is, my favorite. this is like my favorite book. You have to come and take the class sometime. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do I'm it. In. I'm in. I'm <laughs> in. <laughs> But, okay, so do you guys, I mean, I have only read, like, I didn't even read that much until, like, a couple of years ago. I started, like, reading again because I didn't like mm-hmm. reading in high school and didn't really read a lot in college. And I don't know, I just, I kind of just gradually squeezed any taste for it out of mm-hmm. me because it was just, like, this chore I had to get done. But then, like, I think, what was it, like, the, probably the first, I don't know, I guess we started the book club. That's, that's part of what kind of pulled me in. I was like, okay. Do you guys have a book club? Yeah, it's so uh, cool. kind of kind of secret, kind of a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> we read Catch Twenty Two first, I think. Oh, okay. Or at least that was one of the first ones. I think it was actually a C.S. Lewis one. Okay, yeah, yeah. We read The Great Divorce first. Okay, I okay, haven't we, read that one. And that's not technically yeah. a classic, but I don't no, know. I, I've heard a lot about it. I've never read it though. So that that was like kind of my introduction though to like I, is, is Catch Twenty Two even a classic? I don't know. Like it's just yeah, like, Catch Twenty Two, yeah. Joseph Heller. Okay. Yeah. yeah. 
But um, like just Norman Mailer called it, I think, the Great American War novel, Catch Twenty Two. <laughs> it was, and it was really funny too. And yeah, that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I I think I just found like I I guess I approached it sort of like from a like an evolutionary perspective. Mm-hmm. Like if if a novel can stand the test of time, then there's like there's got to be something there, something like revelatory about the real. I don't know. I mean, that's that's kind of like superstitious sounding and woo-woo, but like I kind of think that if something can last a really long time, it might be sort of... How do I say this? It's like not sounding crazy, but... <laughs> no, I, I get that. Like something that still resonates today, like Moby, Moby Dick does still in ways re- resonate with contemporary culture. Like books that can s- still resonate with the, the ones exactly. that... Yeah. It's, I mean, it's the same way. Like I, I think I started like reapproaching even like old mythology and stuff like mm-hmm. that too. Like even looking at the Bible, like, okay, mm-hmm. why, why did this book last so long? Why, why do like people still care about it now? Is it like literally just because it's yeah. this really useful propaganda for manipulating people? I mean, maybe there's some of that in it. I don't know. <laughs> but like, I, I feel like if that's all it was, it would kind of probably die out mm-hmm. and people would, would forget about it because like at, at a certain point people would see kind of see past it and say, oh, this is not, it's not worth what worth anything. But like, I think, I mean, well, maybe that's a good place to even start. Like, why do you think Moby Dick is lasting? Why do you think people still care about it? Oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, we actually got asked this question in class, too, I guess. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, yeah, I, I would say that I think I think Moby Dick is a, a book that wants you to... Um, I think I think it's a very countercultural book. I mean, Ishmael is a narrator who kind of pushes against the Western order of things. Um, and I mean, even in the one article we read in class about Ishmael blurring boundaries, um, I think he kind of wants this drive for otherness and for something um, for something different. Like he wants. I think it's a book about. Um, abandoning your abandoning about abandoning your pre preconceived notions and um yeah no i, like I that. think that's why it still resonates um but it, is it uh, i think what's what's fun about it though is that like i think that's a totally valid and really meaningful reading of what it is but mm-hmm. there's like so many even sort of contradictory readings oh, defi- of yeah, it definitely <laughs> and they all sort of seem similarly convincing so it's like it's mm-hmm. it's this it's this riddle that you can't solve. Like every time you give Definitely. it an answer, I think that, that was something Ken said. Definitely. I, I can't take credit Definitely. for that thought. He, he yeah. mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Evan's here to keep us, keep us on track to make sure that we don't just start talking about a bunch of random, like deep cuts that nobody else is going to understand. We should quickly kind of, uh, go over, try to give a little bit of an overview. What is this book about? We also forgot to introduce ourselves. Oh yeah. We? True. Do you want to say your names? I'm Monica. Hello. My name is Nolan <laughs> Charles Lesperance. <laughs> Perfect. I didn't even know that was your your first name is Nolan. Yes. Awesome. Can we just? Okay. I think that got kind of confusing in the Zoom calls where I'm like, it did. <laughs> Who's <laughs> Nolan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I wasn't in lit theory. You, whatever. You were, right. American not. lit. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you want to try and give us a quick overview, Charles, of the of the story of Moby Dick? Yeah. Um, so our narrator declares that he is Ishmael, right? Um, uh, of course, from that opening line, uh, it's one of those famous opening lines in, in literature because just in the, the three words, call me Ishmael, um, it suggests so much about his identity and his standing in society and with regards to uh, his faith and religion. But essentially, he is sort of a, a wanderer. He's a... a, a country school teacher who has gone a whaling to stave off sort of suicidal ennui or um, boredom Uh, along the way uh, as he moves from Manhattan to New Bedford to Nantucket he meets a um, unspecified islander um, based, uh, based off of a uh, the the mostly the Maori culture named Queequeg, uh, they become uh, what is the phrase? Bosom friends. Bosom they get they get, yeah. married. They, <laughs> they, they get married. They they get married. Become bedfellows. <laughs> yes, uh, literally they become bedfellows. The first 
the meeting. They're, they're literally sleeping in the same bed. Um, it's a nice bed, too. Really uh, big. It's the be. it's Peter Coffin's marital bed. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> the, 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 the he consummated the end. It means that Peter Coffin fucked his wife in that bed. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. I don't know who Peter Coffin is, though. He's the innkeeper, the innkeeper of the Spouter Inn, of course. Oh, yes, of course, of course. Yes. Uh, I'm in too deep, and we're only like Evan. three sentences in here. Um, so, anyways, they, they uh, Queequeg and Ishmael becoming, having become best friends forever after an awkward uh, meet cute at this inn where they, they had the same bed, Peter Coffin's marital bed where he fucked his wife. Um, <laughs> Uh, they they decide to go a whaling together because Queequeg is a harpooner and Ishmael wants to become a whaler, so they they go aboard the the Queequeg, <laughs> the Queequeg, <laughs> whatever they go aboard the Quahog, um, which is a ship. That's that... why Bildad calls Queequeg. Yes, yes, I know. Or not Bildad. Pal- I know because yeah. I'm very smart. Um, <laughs> and the the Pequod is this boat that is run by Quakers. Um, going out uh, for like a, a several years long whaling voyage across the Atlantic down f- past the, the Cape of Good Hope, right? Mm-hmm. To uh, the Pacific Ocean and Japanese waters and then back around again. Um, and the, the two Quakers who are, are financing this uh, uh, voyage say, we are not the captains, though we're, we are captains. Um the captain of this boat is uh, uh, a legendary man, a sailor named Ahab, um, who is described as a godly, an ungodly godlike man, mm-hmm. right? Uh, the, the sort of infamous. Uh, he's a god, but he's he's not he's not a good one. Okay. <laughs> um, and so. Uh, then um, they they set off Ishmael and Queequeg aboard the Pequod. Um, they introduced the mates of the Pequod and the Harpooners, uh, but that's not very important, I guess. Um, well, the the problem with this book is it's difficult to discern what is important and what's not because he kind of a lot of it is just what's important is whale it. taxonomy I, I think Bullet <laughs> cetology okay. type cetology into that computer i think it's even hard i, I think it's even C-E-T-ology. hard c-e-t-ology i think it's i think it's hard in a way to to, okay. to summarize uh, cetology, the book uh, moby dick yeah it's hard to summarize the book too just because okay. there's so and many digressions the, the actual the regular yeah. results you can't not the, the images uh, also, can you start a, a screen capture? I forgot to do that. You know okay, how to do now it with... chapter 32, uh, Cetology, Moby Dick. Yeah, I no, have I it right to... here, dude. I, I, got, I, I bookmarked it because I, I knew we were going to have to get into Th- this that's chapter. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. I got to go like this. All right. My favorite... I think the overview is just going to be the conversation. We're going we're gonna to work our way through this book gradually. <laughs> My favorite part of that chapter is, is the last page. Okay, the last page. Yes. I actually just read this earlier today, and it's, yeah, it's good. The beginning and the end of the chapter are great. I, I actually like the whole chapter. Like, this is one of my favorite chapters. Okay. <laughs> Did you read through it? So, yeah, I read through it. I yeah, yes. Are you able to see? I'm off the microphone. Oh, no, he's going to read the whole thing. Well. Okay. I have it. <laughs> so, the, the thing you got to understand, right, is that no branch of zoology is so much involved as that which is entitled cetology, right? Okay, buddy? Cetology is the zoological study of whales. Okay. <laughs> Um, so then, uh, whales. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's, okay. My, one of my favorite lines in the book is at the end of this chapter okay. because he, I know uh, what line you're going to do. <laughs> you know exactly what I'm talking about? <laughs> the draught one. Pardon? The, the one about the draft. About the erections? Oh, it's oh. a different one. Okay, you, 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 you can you can do the one, the other one first. Um, what, what's what's my your, uh, favorite line? Is the last line is it says, "God keep me from ever completing oh, okay. anything." Well, that, 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 that's not this, getting the whole the whole quote. Then the the beginning of it starts with the erections. Yeah, but this that's a different sentence. Okay, fine. Do you want me to still read this off? Can you yeah, can you read the whole thing? Okay, because I mean I like the part that <laughs> okay. comes up to it. That, For small erections may be finished by their first architects, grand ones, true ones. Ever leave the co- copestone, I guess that says, to pro- like posterity. God keep me from ever completing anything. This whole book is but a draught. Nay, but the draught of draught. O time, strength, cash, and patience. 
isn't that draft actually is that actually how you say that i think i think that's like an old english spelling of draft okay. maybe <laughs> so anyways There's something new <laughs> Because okay, I was reading that like okay, this is just the draft of the book. Like, it's what not, were those image? What were those right, results? Draft. Those okay. Okay, so it is draft. Good. That's how it's, uh, <laughs> I've, Images. I've been reading it as draft. <laughs> I think what's interesting though about it too is Actually, I think that the screen though it's going to be. I in think shot much now. of the book, much of the book is it's not only about you know what's happening in the book, but a lot of the book is also about the writing of the book. Yeah. The process yeah, of writing. Yeah, yeah. So that's why it really stuck out to me, um, just the self. Um, reflexive aspect of it because I think the book is more also about how Ishmael is telling the story and writing the story. What's going on? I might as well just shut the door. Just sit here. Oh, raccoons. Raccoons. I Outside? think so. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounded like a jungle. <laughs> I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't notice anything until now. Oh, sorry. So. <laughs> that sounded crazy. Sorry, what, what was the last thing you just said? I, I got totally sidetracked here. You're talking about whales. <laughs> oh, okay, I mean, I, true. Oh, that I is... just said, I just, um, I just said that I, I like yeah. that line just because I think it says a lot about the book and summarizes the totally. book a lot. Just because I don't think the book is only about the story itself, but also how Melville's writing it um, is part of his storytelling. So exactly, yeah. I mean, the whole book is him just talking about a bunch of random shit. Mm -hmm. Some of it has to do with the story. Yep. Most of it doesn't. Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> also, going back to um, what Charles said about Ishmael opening, introducing himself as Ishmael, I think it's interesting because from the beginning of the book, he sets himself up as an allegorical figure. He, um, he basically takes on, I guess, a characteristic and he almost starts it as an allegory, which is, it makes it tempting for the reader almost to read this as an allegory. Because you think, oh, Ishmael. Okay, yeah, that means this. Right. Um, but then Ishmael tells us not to read it like a hideous allegory. So I, I find it kind of interesting because I think maybe Melville's playing maybe a trick on us. Okay, well, I mean, I think you got to go into like the definition of a Well, I mean, the, the way I think of an allegory, I, th mm -hmm. I think even the technical definition, maybe Evan's going to look it up for us. Thanks, Evan. You're, you're so <laughs> handy. But I think an allegory is like something that has a direct analog. Like, okay, mm -hmm. so if if it's like this character represents this exactly, mm -hmm. it's a one-to-one -one relationship and it's not like... But I think what Melville's doing isn't just, you know, mm -hmm. isn't just trying to like encode his story so that way you can figure out what it no. really means. No. It's like, it's symbolism, yep. which is like bringing a whole bunch of really kind of abstract patterns you might have noticed in mm -hmm. various things and kind of bringing them together and saying, hey, it's kind of like... Well, it's kind of like all this stuff, but it's not actually any of those mm -hmm. things. It's it's just like it's alluding to something deeper yep. and more kind of mysterious. Definitely. Yeah. The one definition that's pretty good, literary device or artistic form, a narrative or visual representation in which a character, place, or event can be interpreted to represent a hidden meaning with moral or political significance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever read The Fairy Queen by Edmund Spencer? <laughs> it's not the one you no. hated. Edmund Spencer um, was a, a Shakespearean era poet. He wrote love sonnets. Uh, um, and he also wrote, he secured his fortune with a just dreadful allegorical poem called The Fairy Queen. And um, if you look up The Fairy Queen, right, like a PDF of it, uh, <laughs> this will be quick. I love how this is about Moby Dick. Yep. <laughs> no, this is good. Well, I, I think it's in, it's in tune with the spirit of Moby Dick. We could, we could... Oh yeah, you, you can't talk about Moby Dick if you're, if yeah, you're talking if, about it. If we're going to talk about Moby Dick, the way you talk about Moby Dick is by not talking that is about true. Moby Dick. This is how Ishmael would talk about <laughs> yeah. it. This is, is this how Ishmael would talk about uh, it. Yeah, let's see. Oh, this um, is... oh, fuck. Lo the man whose muse Wilson did make. Anyways, most copies of the, the Fairy Queen, because it is an allegory, have a, a chart which says that... um. It says the legend of the Knight of the Red Cross right there. The Red Cross Knight represents England. Um, the the lady, because he is sort of a, a, a knight in the spirit of King Arthur. He has a lady who he commits himself. That lady represents the Queen of England. Um, oh, yeah, it the, explains this equals this. Yes. Oh, nice. Right. So uh -huh. it's a direct. Okay. And it's bad because what? Just uh, because look at it. <laughs> well, I, I mean... mean 
He's got all his words. It's like painting pictures with his words. I think the, the maybe the point of an allegory is that you have to figure it out. Well, yeah, th- there is. The, but the ones who figured it out, you're done. Like you no, got I mean, it. You, you, it, it can't be spelled out to you, and it doesn't have to mean one thing either. I don't know. I think well, that the opposite is true. Literally, with an allegory, literally, there's fixed meaning. Literally, the opposite that's, is that's true. That's why every author, like when somebody asks them if their book is an allegory, they're like, no, no, it's not uh, an allegory. Because nobody wants to be accused of writing yeah, an allegory yeah, where, yeah. because it's like, that's like sort of not art. Yeah. It's just propaganda. It's Definitely. just like encoding. And I, your, I think also Ahab is the one who wants to allegorize the whale. He wants to have he wants to fix it. He wants to be like, yep, this whale means this. Yeah. This means this. Whereas Ishmael takes the complete opposite route where he explores the duality and multiplicity found in symbols. Like you see that in the whiteness chapter. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and you see that whenever he's analyzing anything, he wants to find the contradictions in symbols. He doesn't want to say this means that. Whereas Ahab does do that. He just kind of dismisses yep. anything that doesn't meet his theory. Which yep. okay, so we, we we've just got to an important character who, yeah. which we don't even meet until like halfway through the book. Uh, but apparently, is the main character. Who's I don't know if he's really the main. Character. It's kind of weird. Like the the book kind of starts out as if it's about Ishmael, yep. and then it gradually dissolves into this story mm-hmm. about this guy Ahab. Which who is Ahab, Charles? Can you can you continue your? Um... He's the captain of the Pequod. Um, he is very very angry because. <laughs> A whale, a white whale, a white sperm whale named Moby Dick. Name of Moby Dick, uh, bit off his leg, and now he has an ivory leg that is a stump, and he's mad about it. It's a it. nice ivory leg, though. I suppose. I mean, it's Stubb, made... Stubb thought, like, okay, it's pretty, if I'm going to be kicked with a, with an ivory leg, it's got to be, a, it, at least it's a nice one. Stubb's not very bright. Um, <laughs> I love Stubb. Uh, Sorry, I interrupted. And Can so he's... Even though the voyage of the Pequod is ostensibly a profit-motivated whale-hunting voyage to collect uh, whale oil from sperm whales that they hunt and kill, Ahab's goal really is to track and kill Moby Dick in revenge, because for him Moby Dick represents the cruelty of God, I suppose, um... Uh, and to that end, he, he is uh, set up essentially a suicide mission to uh, follow this whale to the ends of the earth and kill it. Yikes. <laughs> I, I think um, even just his ivory leg is really interesting um, with just playing along with the themes of there's a lot of themes of um, like mortality vs. immortality. Um, like throughout the book, there's so many references to his like decaying and aging body. Um, and when he's his hanging bu- out with the carpenter, he's like, I want a complete man. Like I want like make me into a complete man because, you know, he doesn't right. have one. He doesn't have one of his legs. Yeah, he feels like his, his life incomplete. has been stolen from him. Yeah, exactly. So I think his um, his incompleteness, you know, one leg gone is also like metaphorical for how he feels about the world the world isn't complete to him it's slippery he can't grip it and he's Mm. mad at that there's no nothing makes sense or is complete and i think his um his lost leg is kind of a metaphor for how he feels about the world if that makes sense yeah well i mean i i I think is i think i agree that it's a metaphor although i think like the way i it's it sat in my head was like okay he feels like the world has stolen something from him yeah and like it's his right like in order for justice yep. to kind of uh to make sense to make sense <laughs> yeah he's he's got to make sense of the world yeah and so he's like he's in order for the world to make sense again for everything to be just i've got to hunt down this whale and i've got to kill it because it can't nature can't do this or god can't do this to me yeah no exactly right? i i also found his one there was one really funny line about um the carpenter described Ishmael's ivory leg as his bedfellow. And I found that really interesting because um, I think it really shows. So there's there's a passage that describes, you know, um, Ishmael as that as Queequeg is his bedfellow. Right. And I think that that shows right. what they hmm. what they both cherish in their lives. Like Ishmael, he um, Ishmael, he's open to 
new perspectives to newness. He um, eventually um, becomes, um, he's open to other options uh, as seen through his, you know, marrying with Queequeg, um, who's um, an unequally yoked, um, from an unequally yoked culture. Um, right. And Ahab he is pretty yoked, fellow. Queequeg. He's pretty buff. <laughs> <laughs> That's not what I mean. <laughs> um, I was confused. And I was. I thought we were talking about the boat for a second. No, I. Th- I think you. You were talking about unequally yoked in like sort of like a no, biblical sense. No, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I thought he was. Sorry. I thought his bedfellow was the boat, but then I. Forgot no, no. That it's that was the, the ivory leg. leg um, yeah. And it's also interesting too, because then he also the bachelor boat passes by right and that's interesting in context okay. of ahab's bedfellow leg right like what's the bachelor- okay I, I forget which boat was, so? which was the bachelor one the bachelor was the one who was described as a very prosperous boat they had right. lots okay. of oil they were happy they were doing well yeah um, wasn't that like one of the last ones they saw too before i think third so. last i, I think, think so yeah. it's, uh... but it's just an interesting contrast the bachelor you know He's he's doing well. He's prospering well. Ishmael is married to this leg that he can't get rid of, and yeah. their boat is doing awfully. Um, and the leg is also interesting um, because I think it also foreshadows Ahab's ultimate fate on the bottom of the sea. Um, because Which, yeah, spoilers by the way. Though yeah, you can't sorry. really spoil <laughs> this book. This was I was thinking I think about this it's... too. I was like, okay, I want to talk about the whole book, but I don't want I want to people to just be able to listen and enjoy this, you know, as people who haven't listened to it and then like want to go and read yeah. the book afterwards. Yeah, no, definitely. But I, I think we got to qualify that, that like spoiling any, like the book isn't even about the plot. I mean, it sort no. of is, yeah. but it's like, about, it's about experiencing the plot firsthand. It's exactly. like, it probably was spoiled for you. Ken, every time I try to read any classic, Ken spoils it for me anyways. <laughs> so I had to just get, get used to just, okay. I think it's book. pretty well known. Like the ending is pretty yeah, well exactly. known. I think people generally well, know the ending people generally know the the ending if they're like literature nerds which i <laughs> <laughs> was not going into this and i like didn't know the ending of don quixote and ken's like oh this is what happened like i haven't Thank read you. that yet Thanks. yeah don quixote dies yeah he the, does Thanks for okay. Any I mean, other books you guys want to spoil <laughs> real quick while while you're here uh, also at the end of ender's game the uh, <laughs> I think it's also interesting. Bedfell is also interesting because it it foreshadows his ultimate fate in the bottom of the sea. Because you can, um, like in in the Sphinx, it talks about how the sperm whale is on the bottom of the sea and, and sees you know the bottom. So right, it almost right. foreshadows. Bedfellow almost insinuates like the seabed. So Ahab will become the bedfellow of the sperm whale. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's interesting. I, I, I and know. I think also it's just like. I'm I'm stretching here. No, no, yeah, I, I, think that's good. I think that's fun because, but I, I think it's really it is really good to see. I, I hadn't seen that comparison before, but it's like okay, both Ishmael and Ahab. For for one thing, you have to kind of see these guys as these are the two main characters of the book, and the mm-hmm. book is sort of this big yin yang structure where it starts out being about Ishmael and ultimately ends up being about Ahab. But then there's a little bit of Ishmael at the end. There's a little bit yep. of Ahab at the beginning, right? Yeah. And they literally are polar opposites, like like inversions of each other, mm-hmm. sort, of, sort of. Although. Yeah, but, it, but not. <laughs> no, I, mean, it, I, I would think if, if they're total polar opposites, they would be similar versions of evil. But like, mm. wow. Well, see, this is the hard part because like, is Ahab even technically evil, or is is he just like? So. I don't. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we're supposed. I don't think he's good or evil. I don't think we're supposed to say, oh, evil. Uh, Ahab's the bad guy. I mean, he's described, you know, as a Satan figure, but at the same time, he's also, you know, described as a Christ figure. I think you can. Yeah. I think you can argue both ways again it's just yeah, the yeah, same yeah. thing right it's like what does the whale mean right it, it, i think it applies to ahab like, what too. does ahab mean yeah <laughs> i mean you could argue that he's a truth seeker and he's standing up for justice and yeah. he's trying to you know go against this malevolent force i mean in, right. in that sense he's good and he clearly well so i mean one of the pivotal parts we need to kind of point out is that so it's not just that ahab is kind of secretly has this little mission that he wants to go Mm -hmm. and seek out moby dick and that everybody else is kind of in it for the whaling Mm -hmm. like once ahab actually gets out because people don't even see ahab for a little bit once they get on the boat to go and do the whaling voyage Mm -hmm. and then finally ahab makes himself known has his grand entrance and he's like hey guys actually screw (laughs) getting I, i don't care about the money this is i'm in it for revenge and you guys all are too, actually, because if you're out here, 
the reason you the reason you would even go to sea is because you're fed up with what's on land. You're fed up yep. with the structure of things, mm -hmm. and so you want to get over it. So, in the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna we're gonna get back at society. We're gonna get back at everything that's wrong with the world because it's all Moby Dick's fault. Yep. And the sailors are like, yeah, <laughs> probably is. <laughs> And so they all they're all gonna go and try and kill Moby Dick because not not just because oh let's kill a whale and probably die trying. It's like it becomes he introduces it as this symbolic thing of like I mean I, I come back and try to explain what he what he sees in the whale, but I, I probably need to like read that chapter again. That was one of the ones I didn't should should have prepped again. But yes, he explains it in such a way that everybody is suddenly on board to do this Definitely. kind of suicide yeah. mission to go and kill a rant like Well he even he even manipulates them in a way saying, you know, this is what God, there's a line that says, this is what God wants you to do, or this is what God expects us to do. Right. Um, and yeah, people like Starbuck who hear that, like a person like Starbuck would be like, okay, yeah, I have to do that. <laughs> this guy's um, name is Starbuck. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and it is exactly what you're thinking. Yeah. Okay. Starbucks is based off of Moby Dick or the name of the, it was stolen from Moby Dick. And even their imagery is somehow related to like it's like a mermaid. Yeah, I thought it was. A mer yeah, I think it's a. That's, mermaid. I think it's a different. It's or, or, or a siren. Exactly. And that's, is it? I thought there was even like a separate word for it because it's a two-tailed mermaid. I'm not sure. Look, at, this I is never go. This is I never go to Starbucks. Probably. Plus, they're you know, cool, uh, cool mythical creatures. They're cool mythical creatures. <laughs> Look up crab eating onion rings. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell you. Um, we had a. Sorry, this. I, I, I'm digressing. <laughs> but we had a. In our mid Victorian literature class, we had this 45 minute uh, documentary on, um, on what it's like to be a, like a, a servant. And Charles, watch this video. The whole duration <laughs> and all kinds of other crab videos the whole time for 45 minutes. Like, <laughs> how? <laughs> was, this was just to because the lecture wasn't interesting, Charles? Uh, or? Why was it? Why did you do it, Charles? I did not. This woman is oh. gaslighting you. No, I, 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 I swear. Oh, that's oh, actually so my heart. Cute. Hope that's to die. He did him this. Go. He is cute. I, 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 like I do that. admit that. <laughs> I, I will admit that. Was designed to reflect the seductive imagery Ooh. of the sea. Did they talk seductively at all in... Uh, yeah, they say... Whale book? Ishmael is horny for whales. <laughs> <laughs> or possibly I, everything, right? In his... Okay. Squeeze of the hand. Yeah, we should... Let's... We should... This is another chapter that would be fun to, to read a tiny little bit from. The squeeze of the hand. I also love the symphony chapter. The squeeze of the hand is by far the most homoerotic chapter in the book. <laughs> And Definitely. It's so short. Is it really only this? It's only four pages. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not, not very too long, long at all. It felt longer when I read it. <laughs> no. <laughs> Maybe you were entranced. <laughs> what does that mean? Entranced, <laughs> like enchanted. <laughs> no, I know what the word enchanted means. This is, this is the word. This is where the word slobgolian is also introduced, which yeah. is a great word. <gasps> That's Charles what does that word. mean again, Charles? Uh, slobgolium. <laughs> uh, fuck, it's a term. <laughs> uh, shit. Uh, it's a term to describe a specific type of material that comes out of a whale, I believe. Actually? Fiber fibrous? Is it? Or fibrous or membranous. Detritus produced it sounds like an insult. Sperm, yeah, okay, so it is a whale byproduct. Yeah, there's another substance in a very singular one which turns up in the course of this, this business, but which I feel is to be very puzzling, adequate, puzzling, uh, adequately to describe. Ad I don't know. He makes up words every sentence. He definitely does. <laughs> it's called well, Slubgolian. Slubgolian. Which I thought maybe he made that up too, but I guess fair I thought it was, it, it I thought it was an insult. Literally origin is Herman Melville. Okay. <laughs> one, of, one of my favorite whale substance instances <laughs> in this okay. book. Read Moby Dick and afterwards you will have a favorite whale substance. You will. You will. <laughs> I do. <laughs> it's when Ishmael is like, yeah, the whale skin is really useful for like stretching it over your eye and reading through it to magnify words and books. Do you remember that part? I don't. It's oh, it made me giggle. Is that real? Wanna... Yeah, he's he was No, I'm saying is that actually true? <laughs> well, he was talking about how whale skin 
the like the outside of whale skin is really thin and really yeah. translucent oh. and then he uses that as a magnifying glass to read that sounds believable actually isn't that so good <laughs> so good and it's well it's probably because the whale again well let's let's come back to, the, to what the whale represents again in a second i want to try and find this chapter because it's, it's worth reading a couple of little bits which chapter the, are you um, trying to find the squeeze Sque- of the oh it's uh chapter 94 it's right after 94. right before let's see it's immediately adjacent. E five, the Arma- oh, the Armada. That's a great one too. I like that one. Too. I love the symphony too. I don't know any of these. Yeah. I know, it's like a lot of this is just like little, just fun little essays where he just mm-hmm. kind of just shoots Riffs. the shit on a random <laughs> or a random thing that he's like looking at during their voyage because he's like he said he wants to write like a big long epic novel, but there's yeah. only like it's like a, a twenty page story. Definitely. So you yes. have to add about 480 <laughs> pages of of talking mm-hmm. about, well, talking about, uh, let's see if I can find Whale it. Whale taxonomy. Squeeze, squeeze, squeeze. All the morning long, I squeezed that sperm till I myself almost melted in it. I squeezed that sperm till a strange sort of insanity came over me, and I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborers' hands in it, mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. <laughs> Such an abounding, affectionate, friendly, loving feeling did this avocation beget that at last I was continually squeezing their hands and looking up into their eyes sentimentally as much as to say, Oh, my dear fellow beings, why should we longer cherish any social acerb- acerbities or know the slightest ill humor or envy? Come, let us squeeze hands all round. Nay, let us all squeeze ourselves into each other. Let us squeeze ourselves universally into the very milk and sperm of kindness. I don't think you have to read into that too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, it's it depends on if you can, because I think it's it's, I think it's supposed to be funny and kind of touching at the mm-hmm. same time. I think you're right. Yeah, <laughs> I I think I think We're this touching. I think this really <laughs> also shows how both Ahab and Ishmael approach the unrepresentable differently. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Ahab or Ahab, he he sees the flaws in society, the cracks in society, the leaks in society. He calls society a leak ship, the world a leak ship. Mm. He sees that society is flawed, and he wants, and so he leaves society. We see that with the, the throwing away of his pipe. Um, he increasingly becomes almost non-human, whereas Ishmael approaches it differently. He, instead of confronting the unrepresentable head on, he's like, no, I'm going to, um, you know, try to embody truth, but not confront it head on. Yeah, And I think he does that in things that are available to him. He sees that, you know, I think he wants to make meaning with society, whereas Ahab's like, no, society's fucked. I'm gone. Um, Whereas (laughs) Ishmael's, Ishmael, doesn't necessarily you know cross the line where he's striking the sun and inevitably killing himself exactly he's like okay what is around me what can i use to make sense of reality yeah i mean i was thinking about this earlier today like how do you sum up the differences between ishmael and ahab and i think it's like they're similar in that they both look at the look at the world and see it as a you know vast sort of chaotic place Mm -hmm. that they can't make sense of anyways and Definitely. Ahab comes to the conclusion the world is nonsense. It's it doesn't make sense, and therefore fuck the world. Yeah. Like let's <laughs> let's try and get like revenge yeah. on on being itself. Like being is wrong. This yeah. is this is a, a messed up place, and we need to basically just destroy it. Mm-hmm. Like the the sooner it ends, the better. Yeah. Ishmael. I mean, he sees the same picture that Ahab is seeing. He sees a world where, like, you know, it's impossible to not be sort of wronged by by those around you. It's not. It's impossible not to be a slave, right? He says, "Who ain't a slave?" Yeah, right. No, exactly. And he's similarly frustrated. Like, I mean, he, the reason he wants to go on the boat in the first place is he's just kind of like, he 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 almost wants to die. Like, he just doesn't like his life. It, it, it's it's he's frustrated by society, frustrated by mm-hmm. the way things are, and it's like, okay, that makes sense, and. But but he doesn't come to the same conclu- he doesn't come to a conclusion at all right he says exactly N- you know God prevent me from ever finishing anything he doesn't yeah. want to have a finished perspective an on on the world mm-hmm. and because of that he's then unlocked this whole perspective of like beauty in the world and like he he spent he can spend four hundred and fifty pages just 
talking about stuff and making you think, wow, I guess sperm oil is kind of pretty cool. <laughs> kind of makes me want to like love my neighbor a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's a good point. And, um, and again, that also... Like I think Ishmael is also the Catskill Eagle, the one, the Catskill Eagle. He talks. Do you remember that line? Where no, the, no. You know what? what? Is, what is I, 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 I think this is Ahab. Ishmael, not Ahab. Okay. Because Ishmael is able to plunge into the depths of things, and that's what the Catskill Eagle does. Okay. But he's also allowed. He's also able to plunge out of those depths, um, and not, you know, be like Ahab or Bulkington, where you know, heroic nihilists who are like, no, I'm done and fall into the sea. Oh, that's Ahab's able to plunge deep, but he's also allowed to soar out of it. Ishmael. Yeah, Ishmael. Ishmael. I'm sorry. <laughs> this has been very confusing. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Okay. But, okay, that's interesting to, that you compare, because, yeah, so Bulkington, just to, to introduce Evan. Is this a, is a character? Melville just randomly, like, talks about characters and then they stop being in the book. Like, because he f- either forgets about them or just like doesn't care about them anymore. So he, at the the opening of the book, when uh, Ishmael is preparing to meet Queequeg, right? He's sort of waiting because Queequeg is out all night, and he comes at the end of the night, right? So Ishmael is just sitting at the the dining hall in this inn, and a bunch of dudes come in from a whaling voyage, and they're like, "Bolkington, Bolkington, where is Bolkington?" And there's this uh, also yoked guy. Uh, from like, <laughs> is is that actually a word or did you? No, yoked is. I've, I've, okay. I'm following this. All right, okay. Evans here, uh, so yeah, he gets who's, it. who's from like the south, right? He's like a, a barrel-chested southern boy. Oh yeah. Um, who uh, barrel-chested. He, he's That's the stuff. Ma- he's masculine and he he's uh, sensitive, I suppose. He's a uh, um, a little melancholy, maybe. Um. Mm-hmm got that uh, black bile he's a, a soulful <laughs> uh man i suppose and um he, he just appears in the the that one chapter and people call for him and then he's gone uh, and he says uh, i i didn't know i was going to be on the same ship as bulkington ishmael does and then like 20 chapters later 25 something like that when they've just got on the voyage ishmael says oh i saw bulkington on the prow of the boat, right? He's he's at the the very front of the boat, kind of facing the the wind and the the waves. And um, I mentioned that Bulkington was going to be in this book, um, <laughs> but Bulkington <laughs> Bulkington dies at the end, um, and then the chapter ends, and then we don't see Bulkington again. Yeah, uh, it's the the theory is that like maybe even. After, like who even knows the process of how he wrote this like maybe he finished the book and then went back and was reading the first couple of chapters like shit I introduced this guy as if he was going to be important I guess I, I need to talk about it again so like the, the, the Bulkington chapter that shows up later is just kind of shoehorned in and doesn't have like anything to do with the chapter before or after it it's just like it, it seems like it might have just spit but the point about Bulkington stuck in there. is that Bulkington is a man who chooses to live on the edge right mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. E- even though he doesn't physically do anything in the book he he is one of these sort of romantic heroes mm-hmm. who uh, uh, uh is far away from the maddening crowd he separates himself from society and wants to experience what's sublime in life and in the process he dies uh and so there's kind of a parallel between him and uh ahab yeah. i suppose yeah. But he's like, I think, kind of the center point in between uh, Ishmael and Ahab. Because it's like if Balkington were actually going to be the main character of the book, he would be sort of like Ishmael and Ahab combined, I think. But like rather he kind of just slices Balkington out of the story. And then we have like we have somebody who's like sort of big and heroic and like like really he's like a big character. And that's Ahab. And then he has this kind of humility and wonder about the world, the kind of that feminine side you were talking about, Charles. That kind of shows up, I think, in Ishmael, and it's like, I don't know, it's it's, it's like he became two chapters, or, or two, sorry, he became two characters. Well, Ishmael is just out and out incompetent. He's <laughs> he is good at literally nothing. You don't think he's good at anything? I think he's good at writing the book. Well, he's not good at any sailing jobs. 
That is true. He nearly. That is true. He's kind of just in it for the ride. He nearly capsizes the boat at one point. (laughs) Was this the guy at the beginning who wanted to learn all this though? Isn't that if this is his first voyage, why would he? Well, he was he was out on the merchant navy, right? He says, Um, but so he he's bad at the job, uh, being at the top of the crow's nest, which is literally just uh, you stand up at the top of the crow's nest and you look for a whale, and if you see a whale, say, "Hey, there's a whale." He's bad at that job. <laughs> you should do that. You should do that job. Um, and then there's a job where uh, uh, he's he's like got a hold of the st- the ship. He's got a hold of the steering wheel, right? And they're they're burning. They have a big fire that's burning down whale oil, right? Mm-hmm. And he gets distracted by the fire, and he almost tips the ship over and kills everybody. <laughs> Actually, this is dumping off of that. I'm going a little on to off topic, but this okay. is still on your point. Um, it's interesting too because they're burning whale meat to burn the oil, which is kind of also a image of Ahab's soul cannibalizing itself. Ooh. So I thought that was kind of interesting when I read that. I well, love like these chapter. kind of deep poetic comparisons <laughs> we get from you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> also, I think going back to the Lee Shore. I think it's also interesting to read it in the context of Squeeze of the Hand um, because in the Lee Shore, Ishmael is encouraging us to... I'm trying to flip to the chapter. <laughs> encouraging us to embrace the forbidden and embrace the uncomfortable, um, which Bulkington does. But then in the Squeeze of the Hand, that's where he's like... Um, Hey, place your happiness in, let me read this off, the wife, the heart, the bed, the table, the saddle, the fireside, the country. Yeah. Um, which, which is like surprisingly c- sort of conservative for Ishmael. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you like, I, he's, but saying, I, he's saying that you are forced to settle with that. Yeah. That, no, that I it's think not you're the right. greatest pleasure in life, but it's something that people, that's the disappointment that he's forced. People are forced to find comfort in those things. And they can't aspire oh, to a right, higher right. Mm-hmm. level of That's only what's available to you. But I, I think he also is saying in Squeeze of the Hand that it's good to, like in the Lee Short, he says it's good to embrace the forbidden. But in the Squeeze of the Hand, he comes to a realization that you also need to embrace what's available to you. Right. Because Ahab and Bulkington only embrace the forbidden. And that leads to their deaths. Right. But a, I think Ishmael, in the squeeze of the hand, he comes to the epiphany that he also needs to embrace the comforts that are, you know, that are comforting to his mortality. Right. I think that's what it says in the Lee Shore. Um, I think he comes to that realization that he also needs to hold on to that, which makes him the Catskill Eagle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. I, I think, like... Okay, I, I guess you have thoughts here, Charles. Go, go for it, um, Charles. Well, no, because that's not really what they're talking about, I think. Uh, first of all, the the whole narrative is written post hoc. So it's... Okay. fair. Uh, if he comes to this epiphany, he has the epiphany from the very beginning, really. Because he's writing... I don't think a- so. He's, <laughs> he's writing after the fact. Yeah, yeah, but, but he doesn't have the whole. He clearly doesn't have the story planned out. Yeah, he's but he's also writing when he has his epiphany. No, he's writing everything after the fact. Yeah, no, I know, I, I know he's writing after the fact, but here I think he co- comes. I think the squeeze of the hand is a chapter where he realizes that it's important to also um, to also treasure. Um, the things from land too. I think he's describing his realization. Um, I mean, it's it's also almost described as a baptism. Like here it says, I bathed my hands, um, I washed my hands and my heart of it while bathing in the bath. I think he's becoming renewed, I think. I, I, I think he is, you don't have to agree with me, but I think he <laughs> is coming to an epiphany. I, I think it, I think that might be fair. <clears throat> I see what you're saying, Charles. But I think, yeah, like I, I think what makes Ishmael such a like a an interesting character, even like still, even like even with all his like little racisms throughout the story, it's like he still seems like a 
even more sort of liberal thinker mm -hmm. than anybody I can think of because he's like so open to like embracing and like and trying to synthesize different perspectives that he's he even figures out a way to like kind of look at the status quo and the chaotic like new ideas and like say okay somehow we're gonna have all these together it's not just yeah. like I, he, he doesn't say like no to anything it's like somehow all yeah, of this needs to come sure. together and and somehow there's there, there must be mm -hmm. some kind of meaning beyond this he, he's like very non-exclusionary definitely yeah I agree with that so we've got we've got a story of a guy who's like totally uh, totally just open to anything I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where I was going I, I, I'm, I've kind of just got to got have a brain fart you here. have to remember <laughs> everything right it's it's hard to remember everything I mean it's a long book right it's it's hard it's to a long like, book yeah. and it's not like sequential or I mean it, it's, it's obviously in order but it's not like the plot points like stack on top of each other and interlock in, it in a very yeah. clear way definitely but let's let's maybe talk a little bit more about Ahab he's a dang old salty sea crab <laughs> bereft of onion rings <laughs> in this motherfuck of world <laughs> okay actually so this is one thing I was Part of the reason I was interested in having both of you guys on here, and actually, you know, I sh I sh there's two thoughts I should I should try to cover here mm -hmm. real quick. Because first of all, the reason I wanted to talk with you guys is because, for one thing, Charles, you seem to, I don't know how you manage to just like hold so much information in your brain. Right. But you're clearly a very very smart guy, and you made me laugh more than anybody else in the class. So I really Did appreciate Bailey your thoughts. Did Bailey make you laugh too? You hear Bailey that, Bailey? Yeah. Yes. But she, she, she she didn't speak as often. <laughs> That's true. And didn't come as often. <laughs> yeah. She didn't <laughs> read as much either. <laughs> That's true. She's I think still she got on up chap to 40, Yeah, she's still on chapter 40 something. 44. Yeah. How many chapters <laughs> are there? 132, I think. The poem she wrote. Roughly. Okay, so she's still making it. The poem she wrote for Good her job. creative project. She's like, she just had spark notes on the one side of the computer and then like summarizes the whole poem through, her, <laughs> <laughs> through spark notes. That's great. Good job, Bailey. <laughs> But Monica, you didn't talk as often as Charles, but whenever you said anything, I was like, damn, that's pretty deep. That's pretty Thank insightful. You. <laughs> but also I I noticed like a, a lot of the stuff I kind of wanted to talk about in this book was like all like the biblical allusions and stuff like that. And not everybody in the class was talking was about that, that stuff. Yeah. But I noticed that you were picking up on that stuff as well as like the kind of the uh, different mythology and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Coming from that background, I found yeah. that, that this book <laughs> met me in a totally different way than yeah, I feel like it, it may have yeah, landed yeah. for yeah, different people. people. I think you're right. Because no. it, I mean, the whole time as I'm like trying to process my own experience of Christianity and I feel like partially the book is a you know melville giving a bit of a reprimand to the, the current Absolutely. at least yeah the current at that point version of, of, yeah. of faith but I, I feel like his his critique still stands right like christianity I, I at least the so. problems with it especially i mean I, I think there's a deeply meaningful mythological element to christianity that a lot of people don't seem to get and aren't, aren't able to approach the stories in that way like even if you just like stop believing in anything spiritual stop be being believing in the supernatural at all mm -hmm. it's like as soon as you believe in romance as soon as you believe in art as soon as you believe that there's like something about art that's actually beautiful then all these stories suddenly can have meaning again because like especially i mean even just reading genesis which might be sort of like the most ridiculous part of the bible at, at least from a sort of a scientific perspective it's mm -hmm. like it becomes this really really interesting story and, the, and these uh narrative patterns that show up in like every other religion's mythical texts too and it's like why why are these patterns of of, of narrative so pervasive why do they show up everywhere and why why specifically this book why did why does why does our people care so much about this version of these stories right and it's like definitely yeah so i mean when i'm reading the whole time i was reading moby dick i was thinking oh this is just like a modern take on on like cain and abel yeah no i i get that i i have that too i mean i mean growing up I mean, you probably had this too. Like I, I would have Bible, Bible class every day, like yeah. every single day. Like I, I know, I know it front and back. So I've had, I would have the same experiences reading or even, you know, with, with the Rachel one. Right. Immediately you're like, oh, what's, what's the biblical illusion there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but also what kind of, what I kind of thought too of the Rachel, um, is that so? I have Rachel's to actually flip to the chapter, otherwise I can't. The Rachel's think. one of the ships they meet. 
I, I, I was kind of confused in general how these ships or the people on them have like a personality. The ships. There's like the bachelor <laughs> ship where they're like. The ship is called the bachelor. Yeah, sorry. Okay. They meet yeah. over the course of their voyage. They meet, I believe, nine ships, right? And they all have like a theme. Pretty much, yeah. Um, <laughs> they all fail the gams. Uh, so yeah, a gam is a. Uh, it's described when two whale ships meet. They're supposed to board each other and exchange news and uh, goods and stuff like this, and it's called a gam. So the first ship that passes, uh, they do not even have a gam. Uh, the the ship, which one is that? The, what? Which one? The first ship. The very first ship. Oh. Uh, God. not the albatross. Is it the albatross one? Maybe. The Ghani, isn't it? Specs. I think it's the Ghani. Specsinder. Specsinder is a whale cutter. Is yeah. a fat cutter. Okay. I yeah. No, I'm just looking at. I'm pretty sure it's the Ghani. How do you spell it? Um, like gone and then with a Y. Affidavit. Who cares? Yeah. <laughs> I mean. But anyways, uh, <laughs> e- each ship has a different. Uh, uh, Albatross, I think it is. Y- yeah. Um, so the Ghani, yeah. Uh, the, the first ship, they don't even talk, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then the next one, different things happen each ship. So like, I remember the the last for the best, right? It's the Samuel Lenderby, yeah. the uh, Bachelor, Bachelor, the Rachel, and the Delights. So the last one they meet is called the Delights, and the <laughs> Delight was just attacked by Moby Dick and has lost five people, right? Um, and so the each ship has a different thing going on, right? The, the Rachel, right, is lost one of theirs. They lost the captain's son, and so the the captain is he asks Ahab to help and Ahab says no, no bitch, I gotta hunt this this Moby Dick, uh, <laughs> and so that's a major point for Ahab's character. Then there's a uh, the delight or er, the bachelor, which is a uh, they've been having a pretty good time. They're, they're a all, bunch of whales. Yeah, they're all they're burst. brimming with sperm. Yeah, and so all the guys are are just hanging out on top, and it's basically a party. And they come up to Moby, to the Pequod, and, and that, yeah, See, Ahab's like, "Fuck off!" At that moment, okay, okay so like, I mean, so those final couple of boats, those are the ones that I think kind of really cement the nature of Ahab's character, and again, that really drove home this like comparison of like Jacob and or, well, Jacob and Esau, but also Cain and Abel. I, I mean, I throughout Genesis, there's a whole bunch of, and I think this is intentional too, because I mean, the the main character's name is Ishmael, which is one of these sets of brothers yep. that has the same kind of narrative going on but you have in, in, in the Cain and Abel story just to quickly go over it because this like to me I find this like super compelling I think like so Cain and Abel two uh, Adam and Eve's two kids first two kids maybe they have more I don't know presumably they do right yeah I think they do don't they have a kid named Seth Oh yeah, uh, maybe. Yeah, they do. Okay, yeah. They do. See, okay, you you would know, right? <laughs> okay. So, anyways, they, these are their first two kids, uh, and they're supposed to. They're commanded by God to go and like work the ground, but Abel doesn't work the ground. He decides to go and raise sheep mm-hmm. and stuff like this. So he kind of does. He's he's kind of the more liberal of the two brothers. Um, he kind of goes off the, off the beaten path and does his own thing. He starts raising animals. Mm-hmm. And Cain doesn't really, probably kind of resents his brother, definitely resents him after, you know, the next big plot point, which is that they both give a sacrifice up to God, both yes. sort of probably the best of their of their fruits. It's at least it's it's explicitly stated that, that Abel gives the best of his, the best of what he's got. And, and Cain presumably does. It doesn't say I thought it was explicitly. The worst. Well, I mean, that's kind of, I rem- ta- I forget that's the story, tagged on in, the, in a lot of tellings of it. But I, really? I when you, when you read it, it doesn't say that's that. That's what I was like yeah. told as a, as a little girl. I, I mean, and maybe yeah. I can look at that. Maybe I'm wrong about this, but yeah. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure <laughs> it just, it, like, I, I think it's even like they both, they both give a good sacrifice anyways. At mm-hmm. least Cain is at least obedient anyways. Mm-hmm. He gives the sort of sacrifice that God has commanded them to give. And, it's not good enough. God's like, no, nah, I don't really care about that. And he says, he blesses Abel. Sorry, did you find something, Evan? This, this is a short story. <laughs> so, so he brought some of the fruits of the soil. It doesn't even say they were the good ones. And he brought 
fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. Right. Sounds like he so even brought better. It explicitly so. st- says that 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 Abel does the best, but Cain at least is obedient. It doesn't say he gives mm-hmm. the worst though. Mm-hmm. God isn't happy though with with Cain's sacrifice. He's only happy with Abel's sacrifice. And it's like, okay, from Cain's perspective, he's just living his life basically doing the right thing and he got fucked. Right? Yeah. <laughs> right? Like he, he exactly. It's and they're both an, marked. It, right, exactly. <laughs> And he's, he's marked by this, you know, this, like, what on earth, right? And so life doesn't make sense, and therefore, screw life. I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to just, I mean, especially if they're the only humans around at the time, if you, if you kill, you kill, he killed a quarter of humanity, <laughs> yeah. right? But he's like, he, he just doesn't like life. So he's like, okay, I'm going to, for one thing, not only am I going to, am I going to go and just try and end life, I'm going to go end the life of the one that seem, seems to have, like, gotten something good out of the deal mm-hmm. for no good reason i mean he wasn't even yeah. doing what god commanded us to do anyways mm-hmm. right so like why is this guy getting privileged and so he's his he goes and kills abel right and he thinks this is going to be this big moment where suddenly everything's going to be right with the world because he's finally justice is going to have occurred but that's not what happens he is the blood of his brother cries out from the ground and torments him and eventually he's kind of God's like, you know, why'd you do that? Yeah. <laughs> and he gets... Yeah, no, there's definitely an illusion there. But I... I, th- I haven't found that illusion, but that's interesting. Like, to me, that's like the, the fundamental question of existence is either do you want to live or do you want to end life as it is? It's like, because you, you look at the universe and it's sort of obvious that stuff doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Like, you can try and be sort of naive and build a model of reality and, 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 and say, you know, this is how justice works and ultimately everything kind of evens out in the end but inevitably in life it's kind of just like the growing up moment you run into something where that doesn't seem to make sense anymore and mm-hmm. for a lot of people this is where they abandon their christian faith because it's like suddenly their version of christianity was this sort of dogmatic ideological thing where it's like this is how it's going to work and god god is just in the end and uh then it seems like god isn't just anymore and mm-hmm. so what's wrong with this and you can respond i think two ways to the to the sort of the chaos of of existence you can either you can either respond the way Ahab does or Cain does and you could say screw this and try to take revenge on on wh- what the center of, of of what it seems like this injustice is or you can be like Ishmael and say hmm I don't know about that <laughs> right yeah have you Which ever is, read the brothers Karamazov Karamazov yeah I've, I've read I've read the first uh, two thirds I didn't oh, finish okay. it yet but well, I'm neither did Dostoevsky, so that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you bring up the British Um, Well, that's the whole narrative of the Grand Inquisitor and the, the whole dynamic between right. Alyosha and Ivan. I don't know the story. Yeah, you want to tell this? Um, so the brother Karamazov is... Am I saying that Karamazov. wrong? Karamazov. <laughs> uh, it's got a lot of stuff going on in it, but the, the point that I'm talking about is uh, the, the two brothers... The younger brothers, uh, Ivan, the middle one, and uh, Alyosha, the, the uh, youngest. Yeah, um, uh, they're kind of set apart because Ivan is a—he's never, I think, identified as like a communist or a capitalist or some kind of political dissident, but he is sort of this intellectual. Yeah. Um, he's kind of atheist. edgy and woke. Like he knows it. Uh, yeah, and Alyosha is this sort of sensitive. Uh, orthodox monk right in training yeah, yeah um he's sort of um defined by his compassion and his uh uh trust in other people i guess yeah. uh and so there, there's a very very long portion of the book sort of set out where they're they're just sitting down in like a pub and and sorting out their their issues with one another and so the the ivan the the older brother does most of the talking and he's kind of a sets out this this narrative or parable of the grand inquisitor writes um what is it the the spanish inquisition in 15 the 1500s um or a time of great suffering so this is his narrative that he's telling he's saying that he would write this as a play um and and so god says well I, i brought down my son jesus uh, and he, he died on the cross and he's supposed to come back only one more time at the end times. But there's so much suffering because of the Spanish Inquisition here. I'm going to bring him back one more time in between then. 
and so so Jesus is, is spirited on to, to the earth, and he um he passes a funeral procession. And Alyosha promptly interrupts at this part because he's like, no, no, this isn't right because this can't be Jesus because Jesus is only going to come back. He's only going to come back at the end. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and so Ivan. Uh, he he continues on. Uh, Jesus passes uh, the funeral congregation for a child, and he just points at the child, and the po- and the child is miraculously raised from the dead, and he just sort of goes on his way, uh, conducting miracles on whoever he passes, and um, uh, at which point he's promptly seized by the the Inquisition, right, the authorities, and he's sort of locked up in a, a cage or a cell with the Grand Inquisitor. And the Inquisitor explains that um, the church is, is forced to do evil because Jesus did not make his divinity concrete or, or plain to see, right? And he talks about the uh, the temptations in the desert with the devil, right? Yeah. Um, he, he's wandering the, the desert and the devil tempts him. What is the first one again? The bread. Drink. Yes, yes. Uh, he says... Uh, Jesus, I, I, Satan, will give you all the the bread in the world to feed everybody, and so, or, or he no, that's that's I think you're confusing the the last one because the first one is basically Jesus is really hungry and Satan's okay. like, why, why don't you turn this rock into bread? Because you could yeah. you could do it, you could eat it, and Jesus like gives this mysterious like, oh uh, yeah, but actually man doesn't live on, on bread alone, and it's like. Right there, the, the Inquisition guy is like, you're already making this too confusing for us because, like, obviously we need bread. Uh, what are you talking about? Isn't it the second one where he says, I'll, I'll give you power to, to... You could have power to rule over? That's the last That's one. That's the last one. The second one, yeah. he, he brings him to the top of the temple and says... I got those mixed up. Down. Okay. Because that's, like, the ultimate one. It's like, well, I'll give you everything. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so, so essentially the, the point of it, though, is that Jesus refuses to perform a miracle for the devil but really the devil is kind of posing the the, the problem of evil to him in a way yeah. um and, and so jesus and this is a, of course you both know in the bible the the it's commonly said that christians i guess today are better off than christians in biblical times because uh, Christians today can go on faith alone, right? They need not physically see Jesus duplicate the loaves or turn water into yeah, wine. Yeah. Um, they they can operate solely on their faith, whereas uh, he he was physically present during the the biblical times, and, and so the the Grand Inquisitor in this narrative says, "Well, you you've refused to do these miracles, and so." Uh, people are suffering, right? And they, 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 they cannot. We need to use force to to bring them to heal, uh, to to save them. And so, uh, the the Grand Inquisitor is is like, we're going to to have you executed, right? Because you're you're. Fuck! Why? <laughs> I, I think he's like. I think he's frustrated at this guy for 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 questioning the authority of the Inquisition because. This, I mean, and, and it's not clear actually whether this guy is certainly the Christ or not. And that, that's that's the caveat that Ivan says to Eliosha when he challenges him on it. Like, he said, "This can't be. Jesus. It's just a story. Just chill yeah, out." Yeah, yeah. But he does raise a child from the dead. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and so he says, "Well, we're we're going to have you you executed." The Grand in- Inquisitor says, and he's like, uh, "Like, what is your response?" Because the 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 captured man doesn't really respond. And then, uh, yeah. he sort of leans down to, to hear, cause I think he's like, like whispering. Yeah. Or, or, and, um, then when the grand inquisitor leans in, he kisses him on the cheek and the grand inquisitor throws off his shackles and says, get out and never come back again. Right. Yeah. And, uh, then it, it cuts back to the, the top level of the narrative of or Alyosha. And Ivan. Yeah. And, and so, uh, uh, I think they talk a bit more. This is a very long portion of the book, and yeah, the, yeah. the Grand Inquisitor is kind of a short. It's only like a dozen pages or something. <laughs> <laughs> uh, which for for a Russian it epic, eight hundred and forty there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a short story within the novel. Yeah, but I, I, I like what you pointed out though, though, where it's like it, it, the Inquisitor is sort of posing the problem of evil to some extent, and he's saying basically. You know, why couldn't you just make this all make sense? Like, you, you left us with this dangling question of your divinity or of just the, the justice of the universe. Like, you, 
even even as far as like being somebody who's like trying to be a Christian now, like looking at the Bible stories and seeing the way Jesus talks about his own self as as a you know as a historical figure, it's like it's it's hard to dance in between knowing you know what's historical here, what's sort of just mythical, what's what's like just held on because it was sort of a really important narrative moment, and like even the the passage that Christians always point to, like apologists are like, yeah, Jesus did claim to be God because look at he said you know uh, he said I am. But even then, that was like kind of backhanded and like kind of left things dangling. And so this Grand Inquisitor is like, why did you make it so complicated? Why did you make it so hard to press this down? Why can't you just like just do the miracle and, and make it simple? But no, you didn't. You, you left us you left us confused and, and you left this whole religion kind of open ended. But we completed it for you. We came in and we stepped in with our with our institution of theology and we, we, we made it all make sense. So don't don't screw this up for us now by showing up again and disturbing the peace. Get out of here. Like you made you made this riddle too hard to solve, and so we had to we had to solve it and just simplify things a little bit. That's interesting, I right? I'll need to read this. Uh, yeah, and that's Ivan's standpoint, right? He is later a uh, he sees a demon, so so um, he's possibly going mad, or he he possibly saw a demon. So that complicates things later in the book. But um, his standpoint is is kind of like Ishmael's in a way, although it's more overtly atheistic, in that. He sees this this conflict between uh, the the Bible as written and the the church as it exists, right? The institutions mm-hmm. of of Christianity, and he he just wants nothing to do with it. And he he says, well, and I, I think that again he hasn't solved this issue of the problem of evil, so that that's why he he says that he is atheistic, and then it kind of the the ending of the the story plays out in the the grander narrative where. At, before he leaves, Alyosha kisses him on the cheek, oh, right? I forgot that happens too. Yeah, that's, that, that's right before he leaves, I think. Wow. Um, Which, that's, so okay, so the, the kiss to me is a really important part of that story. Because, of course it is. It's the most important right, part. Right, it's the most important. But like, it's, it's important to me partially because it, does, it still doesn't reveal whether this character actually is the Christ. He doesn't say anything. No. And he doesn't respond directly to, to the Inquisitor's accusation. He basically just looks at Ahab, more or less, and says, fair enough. Like, Ahab's whole argument of that existence doesn't make sense. Why doesn't it make sense? I want to make it make sense. And it's like the Christ or the mysterious maybe Christ figure says, okay, like, fair enough. It, it doesn't make sense. I get it. You know, like his his response to that is just to kiss him. And, and, and again, it's not even an affirmation of like, you're right. It's a, like... It's just a bit of compassion because... Uh, yeah. Christ or or whoever this is isn't put on there to explain the the, the mysteries of divinity. He is there to uh, offer relief and to save people. So he he isn't going to to sit down and and give a university lecture to this person like he's a a small child. Mm-hmm. He's just offering this uh, I don't know piece of, of compassion or solidarity rather than a. A uh, fucking university lecture about N- not that theology. we have anything against university lectures. <laughs> no, I hate them. They're bullshit. <laughs> I always play on my. So, actually, want to lean in your mic a little bit. I, I always myself. play on my phone during them. I'm like, you do. I'm like, <laughs> I remember holy shit. we had one Moby Dick class, and you were like staring at a picture of your cat. Yeah, check it out. Here's my my like, cat. This was him. <laughs> There's my. Sorry. Wonderful. Yeah, let's let's look at what other photos I have of my cat. This is a podcast about Moby Dick. <laughs> so therefore, uh, let's talk about the. Uh, well, these are the things that happen during the. Moby Actually, Dick what I was gonna say. Look at him. He's taking a nap on some jeans. Oh, you you posted that. Yeah, oh, that's, cute. that's cute. He likes to sleep on the jeans. The Anyways, jeans. let's talk about the the animal symbology in okay. Moby yeah, Dick. Yeah, yeah. So Captain Ahab, right? He's described as the Caps Catskill Eagle, right? Captain Ahab. And Ahab's? and, I don't know what that means. and, and, is an and at one Ishmael's point, the eagle? well, and, no one's described as it. Oh, the eagle is just the thrown Catskill into the story. The Catskill Eagle is just what Ishmael thinks well, how do you spell is this? the best cat, approach cat to life. Yeah, cat skill. Did I spell it? Yeah. There you go. Hey, good job. This is the, I guess the first time you spelled something right. On this yeah, I thought it was funny how many of the things I spelled wrong. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and so then a, a hawk swoops down and uh, takes his hat, right? Oh, is this the very end you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. This is where most of the, the symbology occurs. Um, 
right? Uh, there, there's a point where they, they say, um, he says, this is why the, the albacore chases after the other mm-hmm. fish, right? And he's talking a lot about birds. And the point is, this Captain Ahab man, he's for the birds. <laughs> he's a real nutty guy is what I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> I was going to say something about um, the Pequod meets the racial. Okay. Um, yeah, this is the part that, that deeply impacted you as a Calvinist. No, not necessarily. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, and I'm not a Calvinist. <laughs> but, um, oh, thank you. Yeah. I needed that. Um, so in, in chapter 128, one biblical allusion actually that kind of came to my mind, um, just because I guess... So, this might be a bit of stretch, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, so, um, so Rachel's, I guess, great grandfather. I mean, she would have to be married into the family for him to be. I guess it would just be her grandfather. She would have to be married in the, into the family to have Isaac as her grandfather. Right. But this, so this is why I thought of. Isaac. So this kind of right. gives okay. me Abraham at the altar giving up Isaac kind of fe- a feel. Interesting. Okay. Just I'll because um, I'm going to have a hard time explaining this. But um, so Ahab, I guess, he. So what's the captain's name? So the captain of this ship, whose name is. What's his name? John Rachel. Is it? No. Anyway, what is the captain of the Rachel, um, he, you know, appeals to Ahab by saying, oh, like, you know, please help my son. Like, if, if your son was in this situation, you know, you would do the same thing. You would help me out, too. So I almost see this as Ahab being right. like Abraham, but actually sacrificing Isaac um, to his mission if that make to to you know to he doesn't go he, on his own mission right so ahab's journey sense. to go and sacrifice isaac is sort of interrupted by god and ahab and sorry and abraham's like okay all right we'll do this other thing he leaves the he leaves the uh mm-hmm. he leaves the sacrifice unfinished so to mm-hmm. speak but, but yeah go ahead <laughs> yeah but ahab doesn't he's like you yeah. know sc- screw screw this random kid like uh i need yeah. to go in and get get revenge on god yeah. does this and kid I, die or what happens yeah, yeah they never say and i well, think maybe yeah i think probably ahab, i think ahab saying like no to this captain he's also in a sense saying that he would sacrifice that i mean it leaves it up in the air i guess but in a way it's almost like he would sacrifice his own son too because the captain appeals to him by saying you would do this if this was your son. So it kind of, you right. know, begs the question, if this was Ahab's son and wife in this situation, would he give that up? And he kind of does, I guess. By yeah, that's interesting. Speaking yeah. of a, a sacrifice, the whole, the Pequod itself is like an altar to Moloch, right? It's I a, thought that okay, too. Say it's, this, yeah, yeah, it's, I thought of that yeah it's a great, because Moloch obviously, in like the, the symbolism of the Bible, represents money usually, right? I guess he can't. I, I, I've, I've heard actually people like modern theologians compare Moloch to capitalism in general. But yeah. I mean, he's basically just this evil god anyway. But yeah, Maybe but Satan it's a, a golden bull, right? It's literally a statue made of okay. gold, True. if I'm not mistaken. Maybe. Is that right? Maybe. Um, I think it represents okay. the decadence of the. Look at that crab go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, look, decadence, maybe? Yeah, I think um, he represents, in a sense, the the decadence of the the babylonian society okay yeah yeah um he's their masculine pagan god yeah versus but, uh, isis uh, or or what's what, what's her name in, in the king ahab did did worship moloch baal as well but directly? also moloch and so in the story i forget about that he directly says child moloch. sacrifice and so the the whales oh true interesting yeah and so the the whales are like the uh they're the children of god i guess they're, they're sort of burned up at the the altar of capitalism, I guess. Um, Which I, lo- I did watch a video on this the other day. Apparently, before whaling was a thing or like a, a, a big industry, there was like 5 million whales on the planet. And now there's like 1.2 million. 
or something like that. Mm. Yeah, wow. And apparent, and, and that's a big deal, even like in terms of maybe global warming too, because mm-hmm. because uh, we kind of need whale shit. Uh, it's like one of the main food sources for phytoplankton, which produce I think forty percent of the uh, of the or forty percent of the oxygen and eat up a lot of the carbon that oh, is on the planet. Yeah. So like, pretty pretty big deal that we killed all the whales. <laughs> What's such as Ahaz? Is that the same as Ahab, or is it like no Ahab? No. Okay, it, it's so it's like it's a bunch uh, of different kings. It's like a like uh, Elijah and Elisha. Yeah. <laughs> why does the guy that wrote the Bible have to do that? It makes it so confusing. I know. Why why did people with in ancient cultures have names that sounded the same? Fuck. Elisha is the one that dispatched bears to murder children. Yeah, yeah, I think so. <laughs> you gotta have a good story. Attached to each one of them to remember who's who. Yeah, yeah, but uh, because the children, uh, Elisha was a, a prophet in dangerous times for a prophet, right? And he was bald. bald. Yeah, he was bald. Oh, well, head. yeah, and the the this flock of fucking children <laughs> come over to him and say, say, go up, <laughs> ye bald head, go up, which is is maybe a threat. It's depending on how you read the. The Hebrew, it might be a, a considered a threat as well as insulting him for yeah, his baldness. Go up in Hebrew is a really bad word. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so uh, uh, Elijah cursed them in the name of the Lord. And so two she-bears came down and each killed, was it 24? She-bears. I think, yeah, something like 24 kids. There's a, yeah, it's, a lot of them get killed. It's, it's pretty nuts. Sh- it's she-bears because... Uh, oh, it's the divine feminine that destroys them. No, it's because mo- <laughs> it's because female bears protect their cubs, so they're oh. so they're more dangerous. I didn't okay, realize okay. there is there is a, a proper flock of kids. You weren't kidding. It's it's just, is it flock? actually called no, it's flock? 42. Yeah. Oh, wow. so, so yeah, it, uh, he does kill like two <laughs> classrooms full, and uh, it, it says youth, so it's not clear if it's like high schoolers or kindergartners. <laughs> but um, yeah, that that happens in the okay, Bible. Speaking of 42, I don't know how late we. Want want to go with this so i want to try to cover at least with the last things that i was hoping to talk about i don't know if you guys have any well i'll, I'll kind of leave it open after this to see what, if you guys have, have some final stuff you want to hit but i want to talk about chapter 42 sure the Whoa. whiteness transition the whale, dang which, well i'm pretty sure ishmael says that if you don't understand this chapter then you don't understand the whole book and i understand yeah. it so yeah. <laughs> he says like certain savage races <laughs> wink wink <laughs> Yes, yes, we have one of his like most over the top racisms where he literally just says uh, white people are the best race mm-hmm. and Dang. like just kind of takes that for granted. So well, thanks. Um, well, I, again, I, I think that actually points to another fu- funny thing about the way Melville chose to write Ishmael. What's funny about racism, bud? <laughs> you got something you want to admit? <laughs> he he. Ishmael is this character that like so I mean there's some fa- sort of like fish facts in this in this uh, book that are like just wrong that because we like scientists know more about stuff now mm-hmm. which is kind of uh, a shame that, I mean a sh- shame in that like it, it sort of can't land in a certain way, way that mm-hmm. it did for the people who originally read it because like part of like what's so magical about this is that he goes out into like literally the unknown and talks about the most unstudiable animal of the time and so it's really this perfect canvas to talk about the unknown Mm -hmm. but now it's like you kind of we know stuff about whales because we can take pictures of them so i don't know what like a modern moby dick would be maybe it would be set in space or like or maybe the bottom of mariana's trench yeah if you want to write the modern moby dick charles why why not write something original because you love cetology you you could you could write a whole book you could write a, a new chapter 32 actually that would be pretty good but why? <laughs> I know crabs. Okay, Melville, he didn't finish the book. This is just the draft. He left the copestone for you to do, Charles. Wow. This why? is your destiny. Okay, the whiteness of the whale. Why is the whale white? Because our, in general, I don't think sperm whales are white. Is it even, I guess it's an albino whale, maybe? I guess so, but actually yeah, there is a line. It's I think, albinism, yeah. Yeah, but there is a line in 41. I totally forget where it is. But it talks about that at a certain time at noon, the whale was seen as white. But it, it doesn't necessarily mean that the whale is oh, white. Okay, okay. So I don't. I. So maybe he's not actually a white. I whale. don't know if it's. Well, they talk constantly about how he's the white whale, so yeah. I would assume that he is white. Yeah, but. So but who knows? They... Maybe he's white. Maybe he's, <laughs> like everything else I in this story, this who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but okay, he he goes into this whole chapter uh, explaining why. 
there's something like horrible and terrifying mm-hmm. about whiteness. I mean, he, 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 the opening of the chapter where he says white people are the best, he's, that's just kind of his introduction. Like, okay, obviously everybody, he's not even like necessarily affirming it. He's just kind of saying status quo. This is the opinion. Yeah. White people rock. But he's, he goes beyond that and says, I'm not actually so sure about whiteness, about it being just this kind of cool thumbs up way to go. Whiteness. Whiteness is a sublime. Yeah. He, He said it's like, it's, it's not even a color. It's like beyond color. It's maybe all of the colors. Maybe it's none of the colors. Maybe it's just the pure state of the universe that's sort of beyond. Maybe our... it's red, but like a second red, like red two. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> exactly. But then he talks about how all cultures, like in their sort of most hushed uh, or like holiest reverent. Yeah, they're 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 most like this. Their most divine secret mysteries all have to do with like white animals, like a white. St- I, I even just kind of the, the one that comes to my mind is from the end of Narnia where they're all hunting the white stag. I think that's like a pretty common trope in a bunch of different fairy tales like the white stag. But there's like just a lot of or I guess I also played um, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild last year. And that was pretty good. I'm not either you guys played it. Oh, yeah, I did. It. Uh, I finished <laughs> did you did you kill the white stag? Uh, fuck which one was the white stag you can you can just find there's a white stag in the forest that you can find at some it's point it's like the lord of the mountain right no there's no a... it's, it's just like a, a side quest that's like not part of the game but like you can find it and then it's yeah it's the cool. glowing one it's, it's yeah uh, yeah that which that was pretty awesome so okay. i like I, I got this sense of like okay you don't see any other white animals when you run into this in the game it's suddenly like oh shit this oh. is like what's going on and i mean that's what he's saying in this chapter like when there's something white shows up or even talks about albino people like what the fuck is up with albinos sorry they, i mean they, anybody albino they have <laughs> they have secret gold in their craniums pardon they have secret gold in their craniums <laughs> you know well, that's the thing in africa is it actually? In a, uh, what african country is it where uh they violently murder albino people to try and find secret gold in their skull shit okay so I didn't know about that. Yeah. But like he... Yeah, Look it he, up. Secret gold in albino people's skull. You really skull. are Ishmael, aren't you? <laughs> like you just have all this random... All these random tidbits circulating in your mind. I don't know. You could write Moby Dick too. He really could. Second... Wait. Persecution of people with albinism. Tanzia. Okay, Artisanal this is actually pretty mining, interesting. I want to see this. fetish and murder in Tan, Tanz- Tanzania? Yeah. Tanzania. <laughs> ah. <You> guys- <laughs> Go Evan. I think, I think that sounds right. Yeah. Tanzania. <laughs> ta- ta- we haven't even talked about Felda yet. Felda is the most important. Fidala. Ca- yeah, Felda is one of the golden girls. She's the horny one. Um, and she's on this boat. <laughs> what? <laughs> Fidala. I see Fidala as like presented. I mean, Tanzania. I see. I see Fidala presented as like the bad side of Ahab's conscience, and then Starbuck is like the good imp of Ahab's hmm, conscience. Okay, interesting. It's like Ahab, don't do this, and then Fidala's like, do it, do it. <laughs> well, Fidala doesn't say much, which is interesting. He's this like mysterious kind of prophet guy, which, yeah, I don't even. I, I couldn't even really characterize him very well in my head. He's just like, because half the time they, he's he just, Mephistophelian. he starts, okay, interesting. But he, half the time he just calls him the Parsi. And I, mm-hmm. I didn't realize those were the same character until oh, really? somebody said it in class. <laughs> I was like, oh shit. Okay. Now I have That's to try funny. and put those together in my mind. Yeah. But yeah, f- you had something interesting you wanted to say about Fidala there? Um. Well, yeah. So he's the, the Parsi. Parsi get the mic is just understood. a little closer to your face too. Parsi <laughs> is, is understood as, um, uh, the sort of fire worshipping this is all stuff that Ken talks about the fire worshipping religion of Persia yeah okay um, uh, but he's also a sort of Mephistopheles figure where he's come to, to Ahab sort of offering power in a sense or or some kind of a promise he's offering what he, him what he wants but it turns out that that um, perhaps he doesn't want it after all and there's where does I I didn't. I, I mean, I just don't remember the interactions with him as much. So, wh- where does he offer the prophecy? Something to- the prophecy that um, he he won't come. Uh, the whole prophecy about his death, and uh, it seems to confirm to Ahab that he will kill the uh, um, the whale. Yeah, and uh, there's also a a long period where it's speculated that he's a secret devil and has a devil tail. Mm-hmm. 
true. Uh, Stubb says he will take <laughs> it and sell it as a. He was gonna rip off the tail and sell it as a bull whip. Um, and so yeah. They, so I can see why you got the image of the uh, the shoulder imp. Yeah, no. <laughs> well, he's always his, he's described as his shadow, right? And like when Ahab okay, notices sure. him, then I think Fadala inspires Ahab to do like even like at the end of the symphony Fadala shows up at the end um in the water that he sees Fadala's reflection um, yeah kind of signifying his you know turn to the dark side whereas Starbuck okay. in that symphony chapter is Let's... trying to get Ahab to turn away from that so I kind of see them as the two like parts of Ahab's consciousness and I see it more as a reference to to Faust of course uh, Mephistopheles mm-hmm. and all this right the 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 devil went out of Georgia and did the that's that's Faust, right? Yeah. yeah. Prime <laughs> Les Claypool is a similarly great artist. Pardon? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry. I I actually I I, ha- I have a little theory here. I want to get I want to finish the whiteness of the whale thought yeah. and then just to kind of put a, a capstone on that because I'll come back to that. <laughs> um why is why is the whale white? Right? All the different cultures have have white creatures that are like the most holy, creepy thing. I just I have I have personal theory about this because yeah. why why is whiteness creepy? Um, I think it's because I don't understand. I, I didn't study evolution, but I read I read Richard Dawkins's Selfish Gene, so I'm pretty much pretty much an expert at this point. <laughs> um, and my theory of why th- whiteness is is kind of terrifying or creepy to us is because it's sort of like a non-category like evolutionarily like we the reason we even see color is because we evolved to to be able to classify certain you know colors have to do with uh like how we interact with mm-hmm. things right so like uh, we begin to be able to see red maybe because we want to be able to identify red fruit and and be able to tell what, whether it's ripe or not we begin to be able to notice maybe we can distinguish different shades of green or, or or start to we want to be able to distinguish snakes from the from the grass because snakes are are one of the primary predators for early um uh quad not quadrupeds what, what would we say bipeds bipeds yeah two two legs not four yeah two, two legs good four legs bad i don't get it <laughs> um uh so like if something doesn't have a color to us it's like it's totally Evolutionarily speaking, anyways, it, it, like pragmatically, it's sort of irrelevant, or at least like we we haven't been able to. It, it doesn't stand out as something that we can like that we would identify as like. There's a certain way I should behave around that. We didn't like evolve to see like things that are white are like basically irrelevant to us, at least or to our survival. Mm-hmm. At least they're relevant concerning uh, evolutionary pressure. Like if we if we know or don't know what it is, it doesn't matter. We still survive. So, like, to me, it's like, okay, whiteness then becomes this category of things that are just beyond beyond our understanding. Like, it, it maybe it has a color, but it's, like, it's not a color that I can identify because it doesn't sort of mean anything to me. So, it's, like... Mm-hmm. The unrepresentable. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's the meaning of life that's beyond what I can mm-hmm. perceive. Even even just from a very sort of naturalist perspective, it's, like, that's that's what whiteness sort of is to mm-hmm. us, us human creatures. Like, we can't, if it's white, we don't know what it is. White creatures, typically, they're either white because they need to camouflage themselves, usually in snow, or they're white because they're like cave dwellers that don't get any uh, light at all. They live in the, the darkness, right? You look at um, uh, all these sort of deep sea fish that are um, either like a dull brown or a white. You look at like um, cave, uh, like axolotls, right? They're typically white. So, so it's almost like um, uh, white. I, I suppose Melville wouldn't know this, though. Uh, uh, white creatures, they they live in the darkness. Or, or I mean, I guess the yeah, the north in in the North Pole or Alaska, anywhere where it's like very cold. Usually, they it, there is a good chunk of the year where it's just dark. So that's interesting too. So yeah, whiteness and and total darkness kind of go hand in hand as well. I remembered, and I searched it up. Polar bears don't have white fur. It's dark fur that's really, really hard to see. Well, it, it says that the <laughs> the hairs are very thin, and they like reflect the light from around them. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. So they're like it's the absence of mirrors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. 
Yeah, so exactly. I love it's how like, this is turning into a biology lesson. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> so that's my theory about whiteness. I think I, it's it's creepy because we don't know what it is. I think too, like the whale being white, also like it implies that it's this blank slate, inviting interpretation. Yeah, yeah. Like, um, kind of this blank that you want to impose something on that you want. To make sense of it, so you want to put that, color it's on not it, like a anymore. canvas. Yeah, like a canvas. Yeah, exactly. Or even like what I kind of thought. I don't. I don't. This maybe this is a stretch. What I kind of thought. Why whiteness is so terrible? I kind of thought when you know before you write an essay, you're staring at that blank page, and there's nothing on it. <laughs> <laughs> this is why humans are evolved to see yeah. white as terrifying. Is because we always had to write essays, yeah. and that was always terrible. <laughs> Set the page to blue. Blue is a calming color. That's true. That's what Lisa taught us. It's also interesting because I found, too, that a lot of... Um, I don't really necessarily know what to make of... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't really necessarily know what to make of this, but a lot of the language that Melville uses in this chapter is like language of negation. So he uses words like nameless, indefiniteness. Right. It's all negated. He takes, you know the positive word and he takes that away from it like mm. intensifying yeah, that like point. absence nothing um which i found was interesting i don't necessarily know what to make out, out of that but well, I, I think well I, th I think that's the point is like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the and i okay my favorite quote of the book or at least the, the most quotable quote to me and i said it every chance i got in the class because i wanted to be you know <laughs> want, wanted to make it a meme was and all these things are not without yes. their meaning right <laughs> Is, is that even the way he ends this chapter too, or? Uh, I think that was when I th I'm, I'm. He says it pretty, a couple times. I thought he said it in the first chapter. Let's see. At the end of the whiteness of the whale, he also says. Um, What's y'all's favorite Bob Ross paint color? <laughs> <laughs> you know okay. me. I'm a thalo blue man. So I wanted to hear what you find found so interesting about the symphony because I don't even that that chapter the name of that chapter didn't. Stand it's out, the one well where Starbuck makes his last play and the weather mm -hmm. is fine to uh to Ahab right. It's okay. right before they go, the the feminine air mingled with the masculine sea brimming True. with yes. sharks. And he has his part. tear. Yes, and uh, his single tear. Yeah. The, the the limited circle of, of our super secret book club will will appreciate how much I loved that moment where they were talking about the feminine air and the masculine sea because I love to read every every symbol in every book as having something to do with a cosmic masculine and feminine and they always make fun of me for that. Because <laughs> it's weird. What is it, like a sex fetish or something? <laughs> yeah. Probably. Probably some like... You really uh, like diagnosing people's sex fetishes. The only other person... Yeah. I did that to one. Iona. Oh, the yeah. only other person I did it with is Iona because... Snails. Yeah, she's... She like, she's into snails? She's, she's dang... Not. She's not. I, I, I get it. I see it. Yeah, because, well, you two would have a lot in common because... <laughs> because snails are her... Oh my god, I got a text. Or, or hermaphroditic, right? So they are, themselves are a mingling of the, the cosmic... <laughs> Masculine and feminine, you know. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, you know, snails. <laughs> see, see, like again, if you were just to write this shit down, I, I would buy it. I would buy that you as a sequel write to Moby Dick. A Moby Dick version, but like about snails. Why? Because I feel like it would be really your thing. Like, okay, sorry. You know we'll, so we'll much stop about trying animals. To you to write this book, dude. Also I want to hear about the symphony. What what stands out to you about the symphony, Monica? Um, <laughs> I think one thing I found interesting and like um, a a running imagery through the book is the Narcissus right. image of yeah. Narcissus looking through the water. Yeah, which um, I I didn't even know that story at all. I'd tell. Well, I mean, can you can you just? I mean, that's a pretty quick. It's story a famous too. one. Yeah. Yeah, so known it, basically, I, I, I actually stories. don't know the whole entire story. Okay. So maybe Charles knows more than me. I just know that um, he sees some... I, I don't know if Melville's version of Narcissus is different from the original myth. Okay. 
I, I actually don't know the original myth of Narcissus. I only know the Melville version that he writes okay. in this book. I just lost so it. The, the myth of Narcissus, it's one of these, it's probably in some larger book or larger narrative, but typically a uh, narcissist is a man who is narcissistic. He's in love with himself. And so he, uh, um, there, there's this whole side thing where there's a woman who is in love with him too. And she dies along with him, but that that's kind of a, tangential to uh most mm-hmm. readings of the story uh he he looks down in a, a pond or a puddle right and he's so entranced by his own reflection that he spends all his time staring at it until he, he withers away from malnutrition and, and is deceased you know and uh his, his beauty his, his body becomes the narcissist flower and uh, again, there, there's some other like woman who's pining for him. She becomes some other pa- flower, but it doesn't really matter. The point is, uh, he is so wrapped up in his own beauty that he it consumes him. Mm-hmm. And I I don't know if the original myth actually has Narcissus plunging into the water. Sometimes he does. Does I he? Think. Okay, I didn't know. Sometimes but... he drowns and sometimes he starves to death. Okay, but Melville has him plunge into the water, which is an I think is a parallel to Ahab too, right? He looks into things, but, you know, Narcissus kind of brings up that question is like, there's, there's that line about when Ishmael says meditation and water and what are wedded. And that kind of brings up the question, are you meditating on the thing itself or are you meditating Mm. on something like water and simply reflecting yourself back? navel so, gazing so, as it were so like with ahab is i think melville kind of brings up the theme that ahab's reading of the world says more about himself than the world itself and that's with narcissus too he's trying to find himself find himself um but then looking into the water he ends up losing himself and that's with mm. ahab too he's looking into things, trying to find himself, trying to grasp the ungraspable phantom. Um, but in doing so, he dooms himself and plunges into his own image. And so I what? think that same theme is also seen in the masthead when Ishmael says, um, talks about um, people philosophizing about water. And then, but if he warns that if you philosophize about if you you the can reach is no place for a platonist is what he says yeah and i think he al- he also says a line where you can meditate too deeply that you end up losing your identity and i think that's the same with ahab and then that narcissist imagery continues in the symphony with ahab let me flip to my book with ahab um so I, I, I see Melville making that point, but I don't really understand that point. Like, what what is it? So, like, you, you're looking at yourself, and if you look at yourself too deeply, it destroys you? Well, he's trying to, like, Narcissus is, he sees in the water an image of himself, which is the ungraspable phantom of life. And Ahab... Yourself he, is the ungraspable phantom of life. Like, he, what Ahab... So I'm not trying to argue. I just no, I don't no, under- that's I don't okay. Exactly understand no, I'm that. I'm bad at articulating things. Um, no, you're, you're, like, you're great. You go on. Um, so Ahab, I wrote this down. Do you want me to just read it? I feel like okay. I'm, I'm better if I just like read do it. What I yeah. write. Ahab's quest is fundamentally ego driven and monomaniac. So it is a yeah. His, his desire to learn uh, what is unknowable is itself a selfish desire, right? When his individualist agree. quest. And so in the process of trying to grasp these these divine mysteries for his own Trump self-satisfaction, I, yeah. for, for his own self-satisfaction, he ends up destroying himself. So yeah. in the process of, of trying to edify himself, he mm-hmm. kills himself. He, he yeah. disappears completely. Um, that's what I wrote my essay on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I, know. I was going to say you wrote your essay on that, but and I, I didn't even like... For some reason, I've just that that whole process of losing yourself because of well, this is the thing I don't understand is because of what like I I didn't I couldn't follow that narrative as well because I don't quite understand what's going on there. 
Like why? Why you lose yourself when you, when you try to? Why is it like staring at yourself that you lose yourself? Well, because I think to narcissus is staring at a, a single image of himself, and with Ahab too, he's he his version of reality is monomaniac, and he can't open interpretation like someone who's like someone like Pip who you know when he he got mad his madness is different because he sees the multitudinous the coral insects he sees the differences whereas whereas Ahab Ahab doesn't and I think does that make sense yeah (laughs) well okay even just like unpacking the image right now it's like okay so you're looking at the water which is just this Mm -hmm. water is like a classical like literary symbol of like chaos or just like mystery and strangeness the unconscious, yeah. right or the unconscious yeah it's just yeah. like it's everything it's just it's it doesn't have a you can't grasp it it doesn't have a form it's like mm. you try to grab water and it falls out of your hand who knows what might be in it maybe it'll be a crab eating an onion <laughs> <laughs> maybe exactly but if you're looking at the water and you're only seeing your reflection you're kind of missing the point of mm-hmm. of water whereas like it seems like you have you know, just to kind of, as I'm trying to process this, I, it seems like there's, there's, so Ahab's looking at the water. If he's, if he's Narcissus, then Ishmael is certainly not because he's looking at the water from maybe from a slightly different angle and he doesn't, he's not definitely, yeah. even if maybe he could see himself, if he were to squint, right, he's like looking past it and he's seeing all this wonderful, terrifying, interesting, crazy, maybe unjust, maybe just, maybe divine, maybe demonic. Mm. Like he's just sees these mysteries and he's like, whoa. I don't know. Keyword is maybe. Balls. I don't quite agree. You don't I agree? That, uh, well, Ishmael is himself on sort of an introspective quest. Um, so, so he is in a sense trying to find himself too. Um, it's hard to say, of course. Um, ne- nevertheless, the, the water is well again it's the sublime right it is um something which is sort of rarefied and elevated and by coming into contact with it um you yourself are elevated but simultaneously uh diminished right the the sheer scale and scope of it is mind expanding but it also um uh it shows how insignificant you are in the scheme of things. Have you ever read the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy books? I haven't read all of them, but I've read some of them. Uh, yeah, the, 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 total per- the, the, the Total Perspective Vortex. Is that what it was called? The uh, I may have read it, but I, I don't retain. You don't remember it at all. I Very I nice. I mean, he gets to be able to show his card that he read the book. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's just like he's like a... Um, like a hose it just passes right through yeah um uh it's, go on what, what did i like mean? it's it's the total perspective vortex or the infinite perspective vortex uh so hitchhiker's guide it's kind of a comedic okay. science fiction yeah. novel and um there's uh oh there and it is, is kind of riffing on the, the cosmic sort of meaninglessness and like the way you're supposed to uh to to deal with it is don't panic just grab your towel and and hang out for the ride well yeah the total perspective vortex is something that um the the idea is it's basically a weapon a science fiction weapon that um all it does is show you the entire universe at once and your place in it and uh (laughs) you are you are so you are so insignificantly small that you will will be like suicidally distraught um and this and, guy got zapped multiple times by it, or just once? <laughs> Wait, who I, did? Zaphod. Zaphod Beeblebrock? <laughs> the guy yeah. who ran for president, I yeah, think. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's uh, president yeah. of space. Yeah. Um, Zaphod <laughs> Beeblebrock. But, he, but he's, like, totally lost it because of this, I think. Um, Was it that he uh, well, was I mean, subjected to the vortex? and he He's the first person to survive it because he is so <laughs> self-absorbed that he doesn't care. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's the guy with two heads. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but the idea is for a normal person, it, it is so harrowing that your only option is basically just to die. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry, are you drawing a parallel here to Ahab? To the ocean. Okay. Well, the I, I mean, that, like, Ahab is the one who can look into the chaotic, you know, uh, the chaotic injustice of existence and say, yeah, I'm going to fix this. Like, he doesn't feel. But he dies in the process. He yeah. doesn't. 
He doesn't do it. No, of course he can't do it. He's not Zaphod. People for all. <laughs> no, but who is? <laughs> who is? <laughs> Tell me, friend. Who is Zaphod? People for Ox. Prisoner of space. <laughs> Pretty big deal. Sorry, we got here because you were you were making a point about the symphony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I was just gonna bring up that 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 same Narcissus imagery comes up again in the symphony. I can read it. Slowly crossing the deck from the scuttle, Ahab leaned over the side and watched how his shadow in the water sank and sank to his gaze. The more and the more he strove to pierce the profundity, but the lovely aromas in the enchanted air did at last seem to dispel for a moment the cankerous thing in his soul. Um, so I get again, this just again establishes him as that narcissist figure who's um, who's trying to. Um, pierce the ungraspable um but i think in contrast to ishmael he fails to see how um people are intertwined um and i think that's a discovery that ishmael makes um and i think that's one of the reasons why he falls into his own image so i guess i'm, I'm more interested in the narcissist imagery than this than the, the this symphony in itself mm. but um Wait, yeah so, i just so find ahab doesn't he can't see anybody else's Okay. Okay, I see. So, so he, yeah. so Ishmael looks into it. I mean, even going back to like, so the who ain't a slave line, right? Mm -hmm. He looks into into the water and sees. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, he sees his mm -hmm. own story of woe of that. You know that his life is kind of screwed and that like it kind of sucks because you know he's living in a capitalist um, ridden America that um, the institutions are kind of seemingly ruining people's lives and he doesn't like it. But he's like, yeah, but you know that's. Everybody struggles with that. Mm -hmm. he, he doesn't. He does, he, like he doesn't stop looking at his own story. He's yeah, exactly. somehow can see beyond it. Yeah, for sure. I I think that who ain't a slave um, line is interesting and in, in uh, reference to Ahab as well. It, it kind of reminds me of the monkey rope scene um, where Ishmael realizes that he's you know intertwined with Queequeg and in, in what they're doing and that you know one wrong move they both fall it kind of puts them on the same um there's no hierarchy in that scene right they're on the same level um and you know cultural or cultural differences and, and racial differences don't matter anymore you know they're both mortality is the great great equalizer right and i think um ahab also fails to see that um I kind of forget where I was going with no, my no, point. That, that's great, that's great. <laughs> I well, I, I I realize it's getting though a little bit late, so I want to make sure I um I leave it open for any kind of final uh, final thoughts. But then I have something I kind of want to wrap up with. Did you, Evan? Did did I, I, I? We made an effort to kind of invite you into this conversation and make sure that it was easy to follow, and then we got into some pretty deep cut stuff too. Do, is there? Do you have any kind of lingering questions as to what the fuck this book is about? No, I don't think I have to <laughs> understand what it's about. You have to read it. Yeah, it's I'm not, not really supposed a, to get it. Or it's like, not really a book that you can be like, here's the summary. Do you get it? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's really not. <laughs> I don't know. There were some interesting thoughts in there, and when I have a, a summer available, maybe I'll take a a journey a through whaling. it. Yeah, but not right now. <laughs> I I think too that. Ahab's monomaniac vision also gets him to like miss a lot of things along the journey. Right. Like even how he interprets Fadala's prophecy is he just projects his monomaniac vision onto On Fadala's prophecy. Yeah, exactly, and that's yeah. the thing that gets him, you know, that gets him to, to gets him to interpret it the wrong way is because he can't see another perspective. Right. And I mean, it's like, also, even if you try to try to write somebody who's in that perspective, if you give them good advice, they just turn the yeah, advice around. Exactly. And make it part They're of like, story. no, this is how it is. Yeah. Because he has just a monomaniac vision and he's stuck in there and can't exit it. And I think to even the gams, the, the, the gam about the, the town ho, there's a line. I actually probably have it written down. That's not a gam. It's uh, just a story that oh, Ishmael yeah, but, tells. But I mean, no, but I mean that ship, the, the town ho ship, they do yeah. have a gam. And then um, it says that Ahab misses the secret story about Radney and Steelkill. Right. Um, and interestingly, like I, I kind of see 
Um, I kind of see how Radney feels about Steel Kilt because Radney's, you know, jealous and envious of Steel Kilt. I kind of see how Radney feels about Steel Kilt is how um, Ahab feels about the whale. He's jealous of the whale's sublimity. It's pa- his the whale's power. It's um, it's. I think it's described. It's there's there's a line um, that describes the whale as um, opposing Noah's ark or something, and like almost like it's can oppose God's decree, right? But Ahab in his mortality can't do that, and he sees the whale as someone who can you know alter the fates. Um, so I kind of see. Yeah, I see how Rani feels about Steel Kill is how Ahab feels about the whale. And I think maybe, I mean, this is hypothetical, but maybe if Ahab actually connected with people, maybe he could realize that, like, maybe if he heard that story about how, about Moby Dick, maybe that would have changed his, um, changed his plan just because, um, yeah, does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, t- I mean, to, to be kind of, uh, like maybe kind of simple and um, I don't know the word I'm looking for, like kind of cheap. L- laconic. Maybe laconic? Short. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> he's so busy trying to like fix life that he doesn't take time to just appreciate it and be thankful. Yeah, no, ex- exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's that was kind of what I found sort of most convicting reading this book is that like, and the reason I wanted to do a podcast about it, because, I mean, I just like, I like, I like the sound of my own voice, so I always want to <laughs> sit there and have conversations with people and then put them on the internet, which, but I like, I like this, this book because, so the reason I decided to do this whole podcast project in the first place is because I, for one thing, felt like I was kind of losing touch with the spirit of conversation. I felt like just interactions online don't really COVID make space. <laughs> yeah, COVID kind of, and I, but I mean, it was beyond COVID. It's just mm-hmm. like, I don't yeah. think the internet is a good medium to kind of have really engaging um, interactions with people. I mean, I, there's definitely a lot of really interesting information you can find on the internet. It's a really powerful tool, but it's kind of, I feel like it kind of changed the way I was approaching people. I was approaching people like content, where mm-hmm. I was just like, okay, I want to get get to the point here in the same sense that Ahab is like, okay, I don't <laughs> care about anything. I'm like, I'm trying to do something. It's like so focused on doing something that is like unable to actually experience the thing in itself. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, the only way I'm going to, at least my theory was the only way I'm going to be able to engage with life and especially with people properly again is to spend some time just doing it, just practicing Mm -hmm. just, and I feel like the, you're Ishmael. Well, (laughs) that's the thing is I, I, I I wish I was Ishmael. I feel like Ishmael is like this book became this, this experience of just hanging out with this guy, Ishmael, who's like sort of the, the friend that I need to kind of learn a lot from because I think I see probably a bit more of Ahab in myself than I, care to <laughs> than I would want anyways and, and, and maybe in, in some sense I'm kind of painting Ahab with too negative uh, a color because it's like I, I, I look at him and I see the part of myself that I don't I like I sympathize with Ahab <laughs> I get it <laughs> but I wanted to I wanted to talk about Moby Dick on this pro- pod, podcast project because it's like it's literally it's just it, the entire book is just this meandering conversation. It's 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 so conversational. I, I sit there, I like I read it, and it puts me in this totally different headspace where it's like, oh yeah, you can just shoot the shit, just enjoy life, like see where see where the conversation is mm-hmm. gonna go, and like I struggle with that every time I sit down to try and record one of these. Is like, oh, I want to like I want to make everything. something, <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm pursuing something. I'm like, I want to make like a cool. Mm-hmm. I want this to be interesting. So I'm like trying to find the next interesting thing. Mm-hmm. But that is like always this tension between, okay, but just chill, chill, relax. chill out, relax, like enjoy whatever's happening mm-hmm. here. And, you know, to me, that's a lot of what this book is about. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. Yeah, definitely. Also, this is random, just popped in my mind. Um, Ishmael's death. I, when Ishmael I. Ishmael doesn't die. Oh, sorry. I keep mixing them up. I'm sorry. Ahab's death. Um, I found when I read read that, I kind of almost, I feel like you need to read that very carefully. Otherwise, you'll miss it. Like I, when I was reading through it, I'm like, hey, la, da, 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 da. And then I went back. I'm like, wait, what happened? Oh, he's gone. Like it, it happens very slyly. He kind of just like subtly puts it in. And then like you have to pay attention to it, I think. 
in right. order to like catch it. Yeah, it's like the, the book teaches you this lesson about getting getting life or at least getting the version of life that Ishmael's trying to maybe trying to teach us about. Is like the only way you're going to even be able to follow this story is if you just relax and just like just enjoy all the little details. Don't get stuck trying to like get to the end because if mm-hmm. you do that, you're going to even actually miss the thing you're looking for. Mm-hmm. You're not even going to hear how you're not even to hear the climactic moment because you're gonna yeah. you're gonna be speeding past it trying to find the end yeah no exactly trying to find the meaning trying to de- yeah. decode it or whatever you know what i blame not these book covers but i blame some moby dick book covers for like for giving people the an idea that it's an adventure story yeah don't you agree like these yeah. don't In a certain but sense, some like, of them look like it the right the cover of moby dick should probably actually just be like either a white just a white book yeah should be, like, there should be nothing on it or it should be like some kind of creepy it shouldn't be this like the image at the spout like it shouldn't the, uh, be that yeah you know where i'm pointing to yeah they make it <laughs> and i see all these like okay like different uh printings of it like oh it's a classic oh co- co- cozy up and just in- enjoy moby dick this great adventure story about they say that it's a it's about this crazed uh monomaniacal like the, guy. The, this is a classic right. example it's like, of what yeah it's not even about well it's like it's sort of about him <laughs> exactly <laughs> right it's and and maybe it's like that's part of maybe it's a shtick. joke maybe it's a trick it's like to grab you and say yeah. hey look look what this is getting yeah. and then like you read it and you're like wait what and it like it's it's supposed to kind of fuck yeah. with you <laughs> yeah no exactly all right any any final thoughts charles no okay that's the end of the podcast then dang do you have anything else to say about cetology <laughs> any facts no. about the <laughs> what whale did you the, no. the Grampus he liked the Grampus whale yeah okay maybe we could end end things uh, and, and, and maybe all say our, our, our favorite whale okay sure yeah so I'll go first oh actually I, I said I'll go first but I didn't actually think through the question the sulfur bellied whale okay actually no shit that, that is my favorite I have, one yeah, you remember been, from class you, that was my favorite been, one you've been scooped son Okay. Well, I liked that one because it says that he's like swimming out at the bottom of the ocean and his belly is scraping the tops of Tartarus. Yes. And I thought that was pretty sick. I did like so that. Silver bellied whale is the blue whale. Did is you it? know that? Okay. No, I didn't know that. He, so, does it actually have a. Um, like three of the whales are, are a blue whale, but they didn't right, know, true. right? So he describes the blue whale as later a myth. Um, but yeah, the sulfur. Sulfi- the sulfur bellied whale and the blue whale are the same creature. I think the Grampus is like an orca. I don't know. I don't think it is. Just for fun, I'm that's my say favorite whale. I like the uh, I like the killer whale, me which t- is me that- too. That's mine. Grampus. Okay, Look, all right. Well, I, I, apparently I don't have a favorite I whale. Love Mine are all getting stolen. So I like orcas. I once this semester I woke up at five in the morning to do homework. But then I was going to do, I think it was actually for this Moby Dick class. But then all of a sudden, I don't even know how I got there, but all of a sudden I started thinking about whales. And then all of a sudden I saw that, I all of a sudden I started Googling thing about whales. And then I kind of went to this, I, I kind of, um, it kind of led me to the Blackfish documentary. So oh, I ended up yeah. not even doing my homework and just watching no. Blackfish at 5 a.m. in the morning. That movie will mess with you. Yeah, it did. It's a sad <laughs> movie. <laughs> Okay, well, I guess my favorite whale then is just Moby Dick. Moby Dick, nice. he's, he's a good, good choice. Whale. He's a good Actually, I have a whale fact that okay. is really sad. Is it a true um, whale fact or is it, it a is a true whale fact? That, that it's, it's not, not like a, a Charles fact. whale fact. Okay, um, sorry, Wait, Charles. No, Charles has. I'm good kidding. Whale facts. <laughs> I've never said anything incorrect um, in my life. No, it's actually really sad. I, I learned it from Blackfish. Um, so there are. Wait, do I even remember the statistic? I think Evan I can look it up. He can back you so up. So there are. Um, oh, I actually forget it. Do you know that the Canada is. geese pair bond for life? I do know that. Dang. So apparently, a hundred percent, a hundred percent of wit killer whales. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, it is killer whales. Hundred percent of killer whales that are in all, um, like Sea World, okay, kind yeah, of places, yeah. marine land. Yeah, a hundred percent of them have a bent dorsal fin. Oh yeah. Which means this. that like they're sad and that they shouldn't be there um and okay i totally forget the statistic but apparently if i if i'm not if i'm not mistaken i'm pretty sure when they're out in the like most whales out in the wild i i'm i don't have this do you can you find it online it's right there 
hundred percent of oh, it's there. Okay, few adult males have totally or perfectly collapsed or partially collapsed dorsal fins. No captive display facilities, including Sea Worlds, have conducted relevant research on this phenomenon. But the yeah the yeah the theory is the, that they're yeah. they're just making them sad. They're all the collagen no in so the dorsal sad. fin is breaking down. So it would suggest to me that they're sedentary rather than specifically depressed. Because a dorsal fin, it should stay firm. They need that to swim. I, I don't know that it's necessarily that they're sad so much as they are atrophying. That's what the mm, documentary said. It. Use it. Well. Use it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd be pretty sad if I was... Atrophying, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't want to say it wrong. Atrophy. Actually, I'd be, I'd be sad if I was a at trophy. The beginning, <laughs> if I at was... the beginning of Blackfish, it was so sad, too, because... Um, they had footage, I believe, from the 1970s of them capturing, um, so they, they go for the babies, right? Because it's cheaper, cheaper to ship because oh, okay. they weigh less. Jeez. So then there was a pot of killer whales. And so the males went one way. <laughs> so because they were trying to distract them and make, you know, the, the, um, I guess the boat follow the male so that the moms could swim away with their babies and protect them. So they're trying to like, um, get the whale hunters, um, to follow the males. But then they found out that they were, you know, that the whales were splitting up. So then they went to, they, f they went to the mothers and the babies and then they captured Is this the... still recording? It's still recording. All right. And then they captured the babies from their mothers. Oh and took gosh. them to SeaWorld. Fun. We're going to SeaWorld. Yay. That's the uh, crown jewel of Canada, too. Oh, it's, God. It's the best thing we have. <laughs> SeaWorld. Okay. I always want, speaking of killer whales, I always wondered if I just, in my adult life, it's been so long since I watched Free Willy. Free Willy. I was wondering if, like, just given the name, maybe <laughs> it might be this, like, kind of subliminal commentary on Free Will. <laughs> I, didn't I think, think it's about a commentary that. about. Uh, I, need, I need to go watch it again. Okay? But I, I, I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try and make that. Argument. I think it's about public nudity. <laughs> <laughs> well, all that and more next time on the. Uh, this could be the interesting podcast. <laughs> Thanks Love again it. for Love coming it. on, guys. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was interesting. If you enjoyed this conversation, feel free to share it with a friend. Or even better, take whatever you found interesting here and go and have a real face-to-face -face conversation with somebody that you care about or somebody that you don't understand very well. I think face-to-face -face conversation is one of the most important tools that we have for building and maintaining real relationships and real communities. Many institutions in our lives have an incentive to crowd out these longer, more engaging interactions with short-form junk food content. The point of this project for me is to spend some time pushing back against some of those forces in my life. I want to practice listening to and engaging with people that I don't necessarily understand very well. I also want to spend some time listening to and learning from some people who seem to have a good track record of listening to and engaging with people that they disagree with. If you're interested in working on some of this stuff too, feel free to keep up with this project by subscribing and pressing the little bell thingy that lets YouTube know that you want to keep seeing these videos. I really think that if we can get better at conversation, we might actually change the world. Anyway, thanks again for watching. I'll see you next time.